By the way, what is it? I hear you eat the same thing every day. Do you really eat Campbell's soup and Chick Fil A every single day? Um, yeah, it's it's not a uh, it's not something that I like to do. It's something that I started doing as an elimination diet uh, ah. from a, an illness that I got a while back, and I wasn't sure if it was a gluten intolerance or a histamine intolerance. I wasn't sure, so I just started messing with different foods and re you know removing things out of my life, and then eventually it came into to what I'm doing now, and it's just eating the same thing. And I'll I'll switch it up though every once in a while. I guess everybody got the impression that I was eating the exact same thing every day at the same time, and. That's not always the case. Right. Like I heard that on another interview and I was thinking, okay, that is a little OCD potential. And I was like, oh, maybe this routine comes from a dark place. So let's talk about that. It's like, now it's just an elimination diet. All right, fine. Uh, or, or like you're so uh, routine that you're like, a, you know how Zuckerberg or whatever wears the same shirt every day, same outfit every day. I was like, oh, maybe it's one of those. Like, I don't want to use cognitive resources to think about dinner. It's like, <laughs> geez. <laughs> no, no, it's it's uh, it's it's maybe a mixture of that and an illness. I, I definitely okay. am routinistic overall, but not not to that extreme. No, okay, that makes more sense. Um, I also I remember you saying that you went to raves when you were younger, which I used to love those things, man. I used to go all the time and they were a hell of a lot of fun. Back then they were actually just warehouse parties, right? It was like you'd show up to some address, there'd be way too many cars outside and you're thinking, how is this legal? And the answer is the police just probably would rather everybody be causing trouble in one place than be all over the city doing it. So that was it. Yeah, I mean, it, it was exactly what you were just saying. Uh, it was mostly warehouse parties. And uh, there was one specifically that I went to. I went to a lot as a very young teenager called God's Basement, which was a horrible name. It was actually yeah. in the basement of a church. Oh, and, that's uh, cool, the, though. The church allowed it, which was unbelievable. And uh, there was, you know, a ton of drugs there and a lot of you know bad things going on. I, and I didn't see... I didn't see anything related to what we're probably going to get into here, but uh, there was definitely people doing sexual things, doing drugs. There was, mu you know, e you know, electronic music and exactly what you'd think a rave was, was all happening in, in this uh, West Philadelphia church basement called God's Basement. Wow. I mean, I guess they got to pay the bills, too, at whatever church this is, but it's it's unusual and you'd think they know what's going on. Whenever I think about my ra rave days, I always there's this probably apocryphal quote where they, I think it was the, a creator of Atari, it was like Nolan Bushnell said, hey, if video games really affected people, because they were worried it's gonna like rot kids' brains, if video games really affected people, kids would be in dark rooms chomping on pills uh, and listening to electric music, and it's like, ooh, here we are. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, it's, it's happening, but uh, yeah. I don't know if it's video games. <laughs> No, no. I mean, it would have been if it wasn't that. It would have been something. It, it wasn't Pac-Man that did it, which is no, I think what no. he was hinting at. It was like, no, it oh, Pac-Man's Pac bad for kids. No, definitely, definitely not. Um, tell me a little bit about your upbringing because I, I, I don't know you that well, but I know a lot of hackers, and I gotta say, I I was uh, in into freaking right, so phone hacking. Every hacker. You just don't get into that stuff in the 90s or early aughts when you're like a well-adjusted kid playing after school sports most of the time. Right. So let me, let me first, uh, you know, just to address the freaking thing, let me show you my, uh, my pay phone that is. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That is at fully active and working. Um, How do you even get a pay phone now in a private premises? Do you call the phone company and be like, I'd like a pay phone in here? Um, no, so so that payphone I I purchased it off eBay. Okay, um, that makes sense. It was a refurbished 1990 Protel, and then um, you know I, I didn't I didn't activate a line like a landline. I I routed it to an asterisk server, and now you know without skipping all the technical details, it receives and and uh, sends uh, it receives and transmits phone calls. Got it. Okay, so you're not you didn't have to like dupe the phone company to be like this is a high traffic area where people might use payphones. No, no. Okay. I mean, it, it, that would have been a lot cooler of a story. It, it's because I just uh, it makes sense. You buy it and then you turn it into like a VoIP thing, and it doesn't need coins. I thought you literally had a coin operated phone in no, your house. No, it, it still is. It, I I could make it coin operated right now. It's oh, free. I, I have the keys and everything came with it. You know when I wow. purchased it, so I could activate it and. You know, there's a service menu on there where I could charge myself to make calls. Interesting. I mm -hmm. payphones, man. I spent dozens of hours messing with payphones, and this is probably a different show. I don't want to get off too much of a tangent. Tangent, but safe. To, suffice to say, in my area, 
they had to change the firmware or software or whatever they were doing because of the red the um, crazy amount of red boxing that me and my friends were doing. Oh yeah, which, um, which is for people yeah, well, who don't if know. If people want to hear it, um, I can actually uh, I, I have some cool stuff. Uh, let me because there'll be people listening on the on on a podcast and on Absolutely. YouTube. So red box. Uh, here's what a nickel sound like. This is a dime. This is a quarter. And then in Europe, this is 10 pence, 50 pence. That was a red box. Um, yeah. And then there was, there was the famous 2600 tone, which was this. <laughs> and I don't know if you, uh, if you recall yeah. that. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, there was the guy in, remember the movie, oh, what was the movie called? Where there was Hackers? the guy, what's that? Hackers? No, not hackers. It was even better. Uh, well, it depends on what you better is. I don't know. landed on my arm right here. <laughs> that, that's true. That's true. Hackers is great, but there was a movie where the guy Bishop or whatever could whistle the twenty six hundred tone. Oh, the yeah. blind guy. That, um, it, that was a that was a recreation of um of of uh the Captain Crunch hacker. Um, yeah. The uh, Draper. What was the movie called? It's right on the tip of my tongue. So, so pe for people who don't know, Redbox was a device that would emulate the the, the tones that a payphone would he quote unquote hear when you dropped in a coin. So, when you dropped in a coin, there wasn't like digital communication between the payphone and the phone company. The payphone would just broadcast a tone onto the phone line that said, six quarters were dropped in here. Now this dumb kid can call Japan for two minutes." So, we went to Hallmark and got those recordable cards the day they came out where you could be like, hi, grandma, and it would say that in your voice when they opened the card. And I thought, this is great, because in Michigan, people used to use mini cassette recorders, which were one, super expensive. Two, if it got too cold, it changed the tape, and it wouldn't, it wouldn't sound right, because it was too damn cold. If it was too hot, which it often was as well, it would change the tape, and the tone changed just a little bit. But 2600 hertz works, maybe 2700 hertz kind of works, 28, 29 doesn't work at all, right? So you had this big problem. Well, digital, though that little 10 second or five second recorder in the Hallmark card, that thing was digitally perfect reproduction every single time. So you just put in a quarter on a phone that wasn't working totally correctly, you'd hear the tone in the speaker, you record that thing or you use a computer to emulate it. Suddenly you've got a thing that's like this big, you know, the size of a, a child's fist uh, and flat, and it makes tone sounds. And all I did was call Japan nonstop, all day, every single day for days and day weeks at a time, and and every country that that I could find. And I, it was the, rep the I remember an operator being like, "You have to stop doing this," because I would call the operator and ask him to connect me to something in another country, and they'd be like, "Okay, you need to put in three dollars and thirty eight you know, $3.50, whatever. And I just do the quarter tones and she'd go, okay, and connect me. And then I, I must have, there must have been something printed out on their dot matrix printer that said, if a kid calls asking you to connect them to another country from a pay phone, or, I don't know, run it by a supervisor or, yeah, you know, ask a question. Double check this one. <laughs> right. And, and so, and then they did something where they modified all the phones, at least the ones I was biking to, where then you couldn't, you couldn't uh, make a tone into the mic before you put a coin in, and that would stop the red box, or so they thought. So then I started putting a nickel in, it would turn the mic back on, and then I could use quarter tones after that. And I was thinking, how did you guys not think that this would happen? This is the obvious next that's, step. That is, I mean, that's the hacking mentality. So a lot of people think, you know, and I'll keep this one short as well, like, you know, teaching somebody how to hack is, is such a broad thing to ask. You know, teach me how to hack a computer. Teach me how to hack an account. There's no cookie cutter method on being a hacker. It's a mentality, and and like you just said, you they 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 put a protection in place to stop you from from transmitting a tone into the microphone, and you put a nickel in and figured out that there was some time that elapsed where you could play additional sounds and add more money to the phone. Um, that is a a mental a mental you know uh, advantage that you had um, and still have, and you'll always have that, and it's something that I believe can't be taught. So it's interesting you say that. And the reason I told that story, because people are like, shut up, Jordan, interview the guy already. I w I'm glad I was able to sort of tease that out of you in a way that makes sense, because you're right. It, it There's like hacker mentality, hacker mindset, where and it does show up in other areas of, of life. Uh, from a restaurant where I ordered two lunch specials and they were like, 
I don't think you, well, I guess he can do that. And it was like still more meat than you get with the other price. And you're just like, you do, the, like a way the system is not meant to be used. But even things like the bar exam, I mean, not cheating on the exam itself, but the prep course, I've told this story on the show, so I'll keep it super, super short. They won't allow you to take the lectures with you digitally. They want you to show up to a testing center and watch lectures every single day, take notes and study. And I was like, that's BS and it's a grift. So I said, I want the iPod version of these. I know it has to exist for people that can't get to a testing center. And they were like, you need to, you can't be in America because you're too close to all of our testing centers. You have to travel to one. And I was like, fine, I won't be in America for a certain amount of time. And they're like, we wanna see your airline tickets. And I was like, okay, so I booked airline tickets that were refundable. And then they would come back with another request. And then finally someone was like, we know you just want this, okay, but if you copy it, we're gonna sue you. And you're gonna sign this thing that says you understand that. And I was like, fine, I don't need to copy it. I just don't wanna go to a damn thing. So it's like, you're always kind of playing checkers or chess, I guess you would say, right. with a system. It, the yes. opponent is not a person necessarily, it's a freaking system. That's exactly right. And, and it is evolving every single day on the defense and the offense. So, you know, it's like I said, not a cookie cutter thing. Um, if you are interested in cybersecurity, uh, you know, that's just one aspect of hacking. Hacking can be hacking people, social engineering. It can be, you know, talking your, and, and I guess a good social engineering example is convincing, you know, whether it be lying or whether it be manipulating your way to get to get something that you want, you know, in just a simple form, like you get on a bus every day and you tell the driver, you know, oh, I thought I had my bus card and you do it in a convincing enough way to where they let you on the bus. I mean, it's such a, you know, a simple, simple thing, but it's, it's hacking, it's social engineering. And then it, that can get more extreme where you could call a phone company and say, hey, this is a, you know, I, I need to speak to your manager. You mm -hmm. speak to the manager, you ask him for the representative ID. And you call them back, you tell them the transfer in house, and then you say that you're the same that representative you just talked to. And now you're saying you're on the phone with a customer and that customer's having problems, but the call disconnected and you have a rep ID that validates that you work at that company and you know a little more about their system and you can you know exfiltrate data out of their account or you know make changes to their account. And it could it could be something like I said, as simple as getting on a bus for free, or it could be taking over somebody's entire identity, all with your voice. You are reminding me of the reps some of this takes, and you're you're right. I, I I know that you didn't go to college, finish high school, and I think it's important to note that because I think people go, oh, hackers are like super genius guys that have PhDs in computer engineering, and it's actually Quite like the you opposite. said, it's kind of the opposite. It's it's yeah. a lot of it is kids who did who had the mindset, but also went through the reps. And what I mean by reps, man, and this will sound super familiar to you as well, I'm getting nostalgic over here. I remember calling a phone company, like, like you said, get uh, some kind of ID or system or term, and they'd go, uh, is this system ESS7 or ESS5 or whatever it is, and you'd go, oh crap, I don't know what that is, right? So then you're in the IRC channel and you're like, what is the ESS7 and the ESS5? And if nobody answers in time, you have to like hang up and call back, right? Or you hang yeah. up and go, sorry, we got disconnected. Yeah, I actually don't know the versioning on this. And they're like, versioning? Cause that's like the wrong term. And then they go, do you mean the install whatever? And you're like, right, that's, uh, in, that's Intel. Right, and, yeah. and you write that down and you're doing this like maybe a hundred times a day for like your entire spring break because you're a loser with no friends. Sorry, I'm getting very personal with myself hey, here. Trust me, I, I've been, <laughs> I, listen, I've been, I've been doing it, uh, you know, when I was a kid for a long time. And, uh, and you know, I would, I would learn these companies yeah. inside and out. And I'd know exactly, for example, AT&T, I would know exactly what system that agent was going to be using, yeah. exactly the error messages that they would receive when a problem would happen, and uh, exactly what type of rep ID they would be using, the amount of digits, whether it be you know starting with a prefix of letters or ending with a suffix of, of letters. Um, you know, there's so many variables to it. But once you gather, like you said, all of those bits of information, you can construct that into a very convincing phone call that appears to be internal, and uh, it still works to this day. I mean, sure. I wouldn't recommend anybody do it. It's, no, it's, it's illegal. illegal. Um, but it's still, you know, people are the biggest vulnerability. Um, the systems are not your employees, your people uh, around you are are your are your biggest weakness. It, it's funny because I didn't mean to go into like 
how to protect yourself from cyber, but people are always like, oh, I need the antivirus program that you use, right? I wanna know how to lock down the open ports on my company's computers. And I'm like, the problem is none of those things. Yeah, you should update your WordPress site so you don't get like script kitty malware attacks. The problem is, the intern who you just shared your password with, which you doesn't, you don't think it's a big deal because that's just your Salesforce install, but what's your banking password? Oh, it's the same thing, but like has two numbers at the end of it or not even that different. And you just assume that your intern doesn't know that you bank at Chase and you don't realize she wrote that on a post-it note and left it on her desk in the top of her laptop, which she just took to a Starbucks yeah. and opened. Exactly. And the, and the 90 percent of the people listening to this right now um, that are using an exclamation point as the symbol that requ was required right. in their password. You know, that, that's something that hackers think of. You know, it's right. It's the first symbol on your on your keyboard with a digit uh, right. with a number. Yeah. Um, and and it, they're like, wait, so <laughs> my last name with an exclamation point on then or like. Do you see that video where they're interviewing some some gal on Hollywood Boulevard and they're like, Oh, um, you know, what do you use the internet? Yes. What sort of password do you use? Oh, it's uh, the year of my graduation and my pet's name. And they're like, oh, okay, how long have you that. been in California? And she's like, oh, three, three weeks. What are you doing? Go, I'm going to Universal Studios. Do you have any pets? Yeah. What kind? A dog. What's his name? Uh, I don't know. Froofy. Cool. All right. Did you go to high school? Yeah. Where'd you go to high school? Uh, St. Augustine. Well, when did you graduate? 1999. And then it's like, so it's Froofy 1999. It's just the guy does <laughs> yeah. it in like 42 seconds. And she oh, just no, doesn't see it Anyone can look it up. If look up you know password interview on youtube you'll see that video i, I know exactly what one you're talking about yeah and it's a, people are like this is fake and i'm like even if this is fake the whole thing that that person just did is definitely not fake not not all. even close to fake social engineering is huge and, and pen testing companies cybersecurity companies still to this day uh you know I, I believe you know most of them the first engagement is social engineering so um you know uh, it, if an employee gives you access, why, why break in? You know, they're just going to, they're going to give you the key. I always, I, I, when I went to DEF CON, which is a hacker conference for people who don't know, a long time ago, there's a social engineering village or whatever they call it. And there was a sound booth. It's a brilliant idea. It's a sound booth. And they'll just let people take a crack at calling, you know, Windows tech support, whatever at Microsoft. And they have a speaker outside the booth so an audience can listen to a social engineer or whoever's in the audience take a crack at trying to get as far as they can. And it was really impressive. Like very few of these Microsoft employees were like, uh, I probably shouldn't give you that information. It was rare. Yeah, they would and, just break and the, the booth rules. is a it was a soundproof booth, and you would just sit. You'd sit in yeah. there, and there'd be people going in and out, in and out, in and out, <laughs> just yeah. gathering as much intel. And then all the people listening are gathering intel as well. So. Right. So, like, if you go first, it, you you're, you people clap more, right? Because if you're the fifth person, you correct all the mistakes the other person made. Right. It's like walking through a minefield, I guess, figuratively. And it's a cool little world. It is. It is a cool little world. And I want to know how you got into it, because, uh, again, I know a lot of folks that really spent a lot of time doing that. And I was probably the most well adjusted of my hacker friends by about 100 miles. Yeah, likewise. Um, I grew up in, you know, not the best area in the world. And, uh, you know, a lot of people I grew up with, you know, doing the wrong thing, doing drugs. And, uh, you know, none of them were on a computer. None of them knew how to use a computer. I was kind of a lone wolf there. And um, my dad's side of the family uh, had some serious drug problems, still, still is uh, going through them. And uh, my mom's side of the family, which you know, have, have been amazing, they, they don't have that issue. But you know, I was in a, in a con contamination between the two. So uh, you know, my, my, I didn't come from a lot of money on my mom's side. We didn't grow up in the best area. But you know, it was a lot worse on my dad's side. So being back and forth between those, the, you know, I guess, it introduced me to some people that I shouldn't have been around at the ages that I was around. Uh, and it got me into some bad stuff, you know, outside of computers with, you know, with drugs and, you know, stupid petty crime and stuff like that. But uh, computers were always my passion. It, you know, I, I don't know how to explain it, it in conjunction with, uh, with the drugs and, the, and the, the petty crime outside of computers, but there was always my passion outside of that. Um, none of my friends could relate. They just knew Ryan's the guy that's good on a computer. Right? Ryan's the guy that I'm going to call when I have something wrong with this or, you know, the, uh, somebody that's not knowledgeable with computers just thinks I could do anything. You know, right. like this, this guy can, you know, take over the planet with his computer. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I was a little kid at that time, but 
I spent a lot of time around older people and, uh, and you know, that you would think, you know, some people might say, well, maybe you grew up fast and you learned a lot. And then other people would say, well, the, the, the people I was around that were older that did teach me things and I did learn fast from them. They weren't the best influences. And, um, you know, I didn't, I didn't carry over that knowledge into my adult life, you know, by any means, but I definitely had to grow up fast. And I definitely did a lot of things at a very young age that most kids haven't seen. I remember my parents being kind of worried and they didn't know the half of it, but they were kind of worried that, and I look back and I'm like, they were definitely right. There would be like one of my friends when I was probably 13 or 14 years old was 20, which like, that's weird. He was in college and yeah, I was in middle weird. school, right? That's weird. And there were guys older than him that we hung out with. He would come pick me up from Detroit, which is not that close to where I live. I mean, it's, it's, a, I live in the suburbs and he, we'd drive down to another place like Southfield, which is another suburb. And we'd be dumpster diving in a cell phone store parking lot with, and I'm like, wait a minute, these guys are like 40 years old, late thirties. They're hanging out with me. I'm 14. There were other kids there that were like 17, 18. It's odd. And granted, we were in a very niche, very niche hobby, right? Freaking and phone hacking. It's still freaking weird. I would have been like, yo, leave the kid, the literal child at home. Because if we have to go somewhere, or run from the cops, what's he's going to hop in my car? That's not yeah. odd looking. Yeah. And not only that, but, you know, even even if they didn't have any, you know, intentions on the, you know, on the creepy side, yeah. they would get child endangerment charges. Totally. Yeah. And they, these guys, like 2020 hindsight, there was never anything even remotely like that. They were just geeky, weird dudes. But you would think they would have, they would, they should have had better judge. These criminals that I hung out with should have had better judgment, right? <laughs> right, right. Well, I guess <laughs> the difference between your story and mine was I wanted to, you know, I was a kid, I was making dumb decisions. So I, I wanted to hang out with the older people and I got along with them better. But I don't know why. And, you know, everybody just told me I'm an old soul or whatever, whatever that means. But I always wanted to be around older people. I've always dated, when I was younger, I dated older women. And, some, you know, a lot of them were, you know, way above my age. But it was my own, I, I, I blame it on myself because I was lying about my age at one point oh, when you I was younger. God. Yeah, Jail when I was like, you know, <laughs> yeah, like 12, 13, 14, I was telling people I was 18, 19. And there's some, which actually brings up a point that I actually wanted to address anyway. Um, you know, when I was 13, 14 years old, I looked actually, you know, a lot older than I do now, which is surprising because I was whacked out on drugs and I had long black hair and piercings and tattoos and, you know, all these things, you know, that a normal, normal child wouldn't have. And um, uh, somebody looked into me and I guess read it and started looking into me and they found that I used this name. Do you, do you remember the MySpace days when everyone was like the scene kids and the emo kids? Sure. Yeah. Well, I was I was definitely a part of that back then. And, uh, and I had, you know, the long hair with the double Monroe piercings on, on oh, your wow. lips. And, uh, you know, and, and I used a stupid edgy name as a kid. Sure. And, uh, and people were bringing that up, you know, like trying to discredit me for all the things that I'm doing. And oh, it's man. Like, if they would just look at the date and they see, you know, I'll be 30 in July. Um, if you look at the date, you're, you're posting pictures of me as a 14 year old and, uh, and, you know, judging me for it. And, um, I just thought to myself and, it's it's pretty obvious, you know, if you even if you go back five years in your life and you read something that you said on social media or you read an email or a text message to somebody and you don't cringe at that and yeah. you have not grown. And uh, and I'm looking back 15 years ago and it's like, you know, it's they're, they're bringing to light some things. That, you know, there's nothing there that's like, you know, bad. It's just, yeah, it's, it's cringe. But yeah, let it be cringe. in the past, right? Yeah, leave on. me alone. You know, I'm trying to do something good with my life and I have been for a long time. Just leave me alone. You know, I went through a, a phase as a kid and I look like a weirdo. I get it, but whatever, leave me alone. Uh, it, this is hitting close to home. Not because I have my stuff. I mean, like I even t dude, live in a life that's even remotely in it. And I am not a celebrity by any stretch, but there's enough internet stuff that sort of puts me in a public eye. There's a Google talk where I'm just like a fat slob with a terrible haircut. And I can't do anything about that at all. Understood. Right? And yeah, but that's you, you know, worse. It, it, <laughs> yours is worse though. <laughs> it's, I mean, Hey man, it's, it's a, it didn't bother me in the slightest bit because it's, it'd be one thing if like they pulled something off the internet and it was like, this guy is trying to help save kids is actually this secret 
horrible person that uh that that does all these horrible things like there's no secrets in this the, the stuff that's out there publicly about me like i told people yes i did drugs yes i committed crimes as a kid uh you know i did stupid things that kids would do um yeah i, I used a stupid name like i was you know i'm pretty pretty public about the dumb stuff i did as a child and uh you know if, if you have a problem with that and that that hinders your 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 thought or your you know what, what, I guess opinion. not hinders, but your opinion. Yeah, yeah or my, manipulate your opinion on me helping children or attempting to help children. Then, you know, I I, I apologize, but uh, you know, I I don't know what to tell you. Yeah, I, these are the same people whose parents wore you know polyester bell bottoms and probably met at like an orgy in the 60s and they're like how dare this guy ryan like emo music that i hate <laughs> yeah well it was more so the the edgy name and i would assume yeah. that you know and you know like back in the day there was like zoe suicide and yeah of course uh, carla curb stomp you know like those crazy names if you googled scene names you would Aren't, see they still have those first of all they're well I won't bring up drag because that's a whole thing, but those names are hilarious. But there's like, are, there's whole sites with girls that have tons of tattoos that use names like that that are fairly popular. Now, those may be a different genre. I'm only going off rumor because I've never seen them myself. Oh, I've but, never uh, heard of them sites. <laughs> I've never either. heard of it. Um, <laughs> but you've done some other incredible stuff that should easily outweigh that. I mean, you started a rehab at, by the time most people were having their first beer, you had founded a rehab center, essentially. Yeah. Is that accurate? That is accurate. So, so I, uh, do you want to hear the whole story of how that happened or do you want to just hear when I got to Florida? You know, why not? Um, yeah, because we, okay. since we're friends, I can trick you into coming back on the show if we need more time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I would love, yeah, I would love to be back. Um, yeah, but yeah, so, so long story short, uh, I was dating a girl named Angelica and I knew her since I was a kid as well, actually. She ended up in Florida for her own personal reasons and uh, I was still living in Pennsylvania at this time. And I was flying back and forth to see Angelica and, you know, maybe one week out of each month, I would uh, sometimes more, but most, it was like one week out of each month. And I would fly back and forth to Florida and I'd see her and she lived right near a Starbucks in, in uh, South Florida. And, you know, every time we'd go to the Starbucks, it would be packed with a ton of these people. And I would see the same people every time and they'd all be talking about drug rehab and, uh, and they'd be talking about uh, saying, Hey, if you know anybody in Pennsylvania, that needs treatment, you know, we'll pay you this, this, you know, it was a, a pretty significant amount of money per person that you can send to rehab. Um, I, I asked her about that. I was like, why are all these people bringing up the, you know, they'll pay me to put people in rehab. I never heard of anything like that before. Cause every rehab I ever went to as a kid was all government, you know, subsidized yeah, and judge Medicaid sends you there, right? Yeah. A judge sends you there or, or you, you know, their Medicare, Medicaid facilities. So, all these people, they're driving around in Mercedes and BMWs. They got nice watches and they, you know, they're, they look like they just got clean a couple of weeks ago, you know, and, and they're, they're talking about, you know, a couple thousand dollars per person. And I, and, you know, I, I found out from my ex-girlfriend that that's a thing called patient brokering, which is a felony. Um, it's, oh, not, it is. it's not, yeah. So you can't, there's no such, like, there's no such thing as giving a kickback in the healthcare space. You, uh, you can't, it's, you're, you're brokering human beings. I see. So, I mean, that sounds fair now that you explain it. Yeah. Because yeah, to me, I'm like, so, oh, lead generation. Oh, maybe this is a well, little gross. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I'll, I'll go into that too, because, you know, after I found out it was illegal, which I never ended up doing, I didn't know anybody that had private insurance in the first place to get them to travel to Florida, uh, even if I did want to make that decision. But, uh, I, you know, I, I went, you know, I did my research. I had a background in internet marketing as, you know, as well. And um, I did, did some research and I found there was a lot of treatment marketing companies out there. So I would call them up, you know, they were running PPC campaigns on Google, just, you know, pay per click. And when they would pick up the phone, it would sometimes be one facility and then another time it'd be a different facility where then other call centers, it would be the same guy picking up. But depending on what type of health insurance you had, they would send you to whatever facility paid, you know, that insurance company would pay the highest for it. Uh -huh. The problem there is... A lot of the facilities, including mine, are dual diagnosis. So their mental health was, they changed it from substance abuse to substance use. So it's dual diagnosis, substance use, and mental health disorders. And, you know, let's say somebody has a severe eating disorder, but they're also addicted to some type of narcotic or drug. And, you know, they call this, you know, they call a treatment marketing phone number and they get in touch with some guy. They say they have a, um, let's say, a, Blue Cross Blue Shield PPO that has a low deductible 
and they know it's going to pay very high. That person with an eating disorder needs to go to an eating disorder clinic sure. that also helps people with drug addiction. Oh, um, I see where you're instead, going with this. Instead, these marketing companies right. were sending people to whatever places were going to be paying them the most money. And that didn't sit right with me. And I thought, okay, well, I can do these same things. I can run the same campaigns, but I can work with the right facilities and send them to the right places. So I started a company called thetreatmentsource.com, which was just basically a landing page on a website. And I did some, some very targeted Facebook campaigns and I didn't have uh, you know, the, the budget behind me at, in the beginning of this project to do what a lot of those marketing companies were doing. But uh, the campaign started to work very well and I was putting people into treatment, but wasn't making a ton of money at that moment. Um, once uh, some rehabs found out that, hey, this guy can get people in and he's doing it through you know, the legitimate routes and they're, you know, they have private health insurance and you, you, can't, you can't do like a cost per acquisition or a cost per client because that's where the patient brokering comes in, but you can pay somebody for a, um, you know, a flat fee for their services. So I would go to these facilities while I was still dating this girl, flying back and forth. I'd show up at these rehabs and say, hey, here's my site. This is how many you know, leads on average that we're, we're bringing in, which when I say we're, I'm talking about myself, but you know, they didn't know that at the yeah, time. Yeah, me, myself, and I, the three people that work <laughs> at my company. <laughs> exactly, exactly. This is right in the beginning of the treatment source, which was you know, very short-lived, actually, but it worked. And I, I talked to a bunch of treatment centers, and they all threw up money separately. I had contracts with each one. I could not put a number of clients on that contract because the second you put a number in association with the dollar amount, it becomes a crime. And uh, right, you know, because that was you can the, break it down and do a per client exactly. price. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Gotcha. So you know, I did a good job in that area. I made sure that the people that that needed help were were getting the right help that they needed. And I ran into a guy who, you know, I, I got along with better than the other facilities. I didn't have a problem with anybody, but we, we became friends pretty quickly. And he stayed in touch with me. And one day he calls me, I still live in PA at this time in Pennsylvania. And he says to me, uh, hey, you won't come to the Fort Lauderdale airport right now. And uh, like, just joking with me. And I'm just waking up and I'm like, yeah, okay. And then, you know, I end the call. I book my flight within three hours. And then I call him, it, maybe, I don't know if it was a couple hours after that or not. But the same day I call him and I say, hey, I'm at the Fort Lauderdale airport. <laughs> And he just, he's not believing me. Like, you know, I genuinely got on a plane and flew that same day. Wow. I went and met up with him, picked me up at the airport. And, uh, and I went back to his house. I stayed with him for about a week. We discussed, you know, some marketing ideas. And at that point, I had a contract with a facility he owned prior. I had no ownership in that facility. Um, so after that week was up, you know, I, I decided, well, if, he, if I can stay with him until I find a house to buy in Florida or somewhere to stay or get my own place, I'll do that. He offered, he offered to let me stay with him. So I did. Um, I flew back to Pennsylvania. I got a U-Haul, put my car on the back of it with a trailer, drove down to Florida and stayed at his house. And I convinced him. And, you know, he also had a part in this decision, but to sell his shares in his rehab and to start one with me. So I dropped all my contracts with all the other facilities and did all of the marketing from my own facility that started the first one. And um, I filled that one, um, you know, with the, with the, marketing campaign itself. The treatment source was gone. Um, we, we did the marketing for the facility directly. And that turned into a, a partial hospitalization, uh, intensive outpatient and outpatient facility. But wow. we didn't have any medical detoxes. So we would have to send them to other facilities to, uh, to you know, let's say someone's going through withdrawal from whatever drug or alcohol, uh, they would have to get detox medically, and then they'd be sent to us for their, their, their treatment. Um, we thought that, you know, after, you know, we brought in some money and things were going well, we provided great quality care, which I can get more into that if you're interested. Um, we, we opened two uh, detox facilities as well. So I ended up having three facilities with 144 beds, 120 employees, and I was the CEO of, uh, of that facility. So it was, uh, it was an honor. I was able to help a ton of people and, and um, you know, start a cool scholarship program for people that were just like me that didn't have money, didn't have insurance, that uh, needed help and didn't didn't have a three month wait, you know, where, where these other facilities have three month waiting lists. Oh you know, man. Government, Imagine being government an facilities. addict, you need, you decide to get clean and they're telling you sure in 90 days you can come in. I mean, you could be dead by then if you're that far down. The yeah, road. that's, that's exactly the point. It's, you know, you, you can't tell an addict to wait three months. No. You know, they, they don't have three months, especially now in 2023. It's the, the, the number one leading cause of death, 18 to 49 years old for the last two years. 
And, uh, you know, an addict doesn't have three months to wait. And so I started that scholarship program, which meant, you know, you come to treatment, you fly to Florida and you stay for as long as it takes till the, the clinicians say that you, you know, you're ready to go or you walk out the door on your own. But I, I did that. And, you know, that was, uh, I was super, uh, super successful in my huh. opinion. It wasn't profitable, but it was, it felt good. And I, I feel, I feel that I helped you know, a good amount of people that way. So heart disease and cancer don't kill more people than dr- what is it? Fentanyl now? Yeah. I mean, I can, I can double check the statistic. Uh, or maybe it's the age quick. group, right? Cause maybe um, cancer and heart 18, attacks are above 49 leading cause of death. Let's see. I guess there's a, there's a debate on it, which I didn't know that here. Um, I, I watched something uh, yesterday, Jelly Roll, I think it was, on okay. Joe Rogan, and he, I think he said it was an opiate overdose every 11 minutes. Oh my god! Like, with death. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, maybe maybe this is fake. So I'm looking at the fact check on that, and it says fentanyl is not the leading cause of death for adults in the U.S. in the CDC data from 2020. Okay. The top three causes listed are heart disease, cancer, and COVID. Well, we'll find but, out um, in a couple of years. What, yeah, let me know it, if you find out yeah. otherwise, but I definitely heard it many times. So yeah. I know that well, it, it surpassed 100,000 in 2021. I think we can safely say either way that if you are already addicted to something, you there, you have a great chance of dying, especially if it's an opiate. So we don't have to split hairs on it. It doesn't matter. Yeah, but don't don't discount the, don't discount the, you know, the Xanax, the Coke, all the new oh, things. Yeah. People are dying from them too with the, with fentanyl, you know, this fentanyl's and everything, all you the know, different types. I hadn't thought about that, but you're right. There's people the friends of friends who like went to a party and tried cocaine and it was laced with fentanyl and they're dead and it's like it, that's that should scare anybody who's a recreate back when i worked on wall street people would be like hey you look tired and i'm like yeah i need a red bull and they're like forget that crap come into my office you know and you're like oh but 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 now it's like you could just die from that because he just bought yeah. it and hasn't tried it or has exactly a that's just reminded me too, like, and, and this sounds absolutely insane. I know before I'm saying it, but you know, back when I was a kid, heroin was like oh, a, a thousand times safer than it was today. Like I, I knew of one person growing up, you know, when I did, I, I stopped using drugs around 17. So I knew of one person that died of an opiate overdose um, and it was mixed with other things. And now almost everyone I grew up with is dead. Oh a couple my of my family members are dead. You know, I, there's there's a whole other, you know, I, I, you know, how I found my best friend dead. And uh, he just, you know, he did well for a year straight. And I, I walked in and found him, you know, on, in his bathroom, you know, he was gone. And uh, he, he made the mistake one night. He was completely fine. He just made, he had one slip up and he was gone. And, um, you know, I, I just can't imagine why people would want to do that, but I guess, you know, I, I can understand being an addict and not being able to stop. It's a, I don't know. I don't associate with it completely as being an addict for life. I, I don't believe that I am personally, but I do. I definitely know that some people are. So it's hard for me to understand everybody's opinion on it or everybody's, uh, everybody's mindset on it. But uh, as, especially for my, my, my best friend, he, he was, you know, just like, just like you and I, you know, he just made a mistake one night. And that was it. No, that yeah. was. Yeah, sorry, I mean, I'll, I'll save all that. the details for the story of the story because it's it makes me upset to talk yeah, about. Yeah, I don't. It. You don't have to to relive that gruesome, just devastating moment for sure. It's just, I think it makes a lot of sense. It illustrates the 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 way that you grew up and and how your re, that informs your rehab practice and your that all sets a good baseline for. Okay, I'm an entrepreneur. Obviously, I'm a doer. You gra- you know, you, you dropped out of high school and started a business by age 22 that most people would be lucky to have when they're in their 40s, right? And and it was based upon helping people but also making money. And I know you do things like you're, you're an ethical hacker, which t- well, first of all, tell us what that is cuz uh, a lot of people have never heard those two words put together. Gotcha. So, an ethical hacker is um, you know, I like to call myself a cybersecurity professional, but an ethical hacker is somebody that there's three different types of hackers. There's a black hat, a gray hat, and a white hat. Black hat is somebody that you know commits crimes. Gray hat, someone kind of in between, where like you know they'll hack your website, they'll send you an email saying, "Hey, I found a vulnerability in your site. You should probably fix this um, and without permission." And then a white hat hacker it would be you know, let's say Jordan contacted me and said, "Hey, I want you to test my site. We, you know, we have uh, rules of engagement. We have scope." And, uh, you know, then, you know, we, we, we do something with his full permission. Um, you know, that's, that's like a 30,000 foot view of what that means. 
But uh, that's something else I wanted to talk about uh, is, you know, there's some titles online saying number one ethical hacker does that. this, does that. And I'm not a self-proclaimed number one ethical hacker. The, the reason why that title be became, you know, a thing was because there was a website out there for, you know, some, you know, there's some training stuff there I and there's some that. competitive <laughs> stuff. And I'm number, like, number one. How do they, how is he ranked? And then I was like, oh, here's where he's ranked on this training site for being like in the leaderboards. But, okay. Yeah. So it, it wasn't always a training site. So there, half of the site is training. So if you don't know anything at all, you, you can learn on there. And then the other side is competitive. So if you end up solving these simulated challenges, which are just like real life environments, some, most of the time, um, if you if you solve them first, you get extra points, and those points will, will allow you to move up on the leaderboard. And since there's two million users on this website, almost I think it's just shy of two million. Being number one on there was very difficult for me to get. Um, that doesn't mean I'm the best hacker in the world. That just means that, that I worked very hard to get to where I was at. And um, you know, I, I want to make it clear that I'm not a self-proclaimed best hacker like Kevin Mitnick or somebody like that. I think Kevin Mitnick did say he was the best hacker. I could be wrong yeah, on that. Well, he would say that. And also, I'm not sure everyone else <laughs> agrees with him, but we'll leave that. I don't agree with right him. There. I do yeah. not agree with him. No. You're probably a better phone freaker than Kevin Mitnick. Uh, I, I won't say that, but I will let other people say that. And I will. And I've look, he was nice to me. And I will say this, but his opinion of himself may be slightly different than his skill level reflects. Uh, anyway, <laughs> so yeah, I so, understand where you're going with that yeah. one. I got you. Yeah, that happens to people. Whatever, not a big deal. So the yes, ethical hacking, pen, penetration testing. When I was doing the social engineering stuff, I worked with a lot of pen testers. I know you run pentester.com, which we'll link in the show notes. Oh, thank the, you. This is like so. Just to, I'll save you a second here. P the difference between white and and black hat hacking is kind of like. If I want to test if my store is secure, I might hire somebody to break in. And I'm standing there watching them pick the lock and then go to the cash register and pry that thing open and get through the little gate I have to the office. I, and I go, okay, I need a stronger lock, a stronger door. I need a little metal grate. Thank you. And they say, no problem. The black hat version, the guy just breaks in and robs me and then says, if you want your stuff back, you could, or, or if, if that, maybe I just get robbed. Or if I'm lucky, they say, if you want your stuff back, send me 10 grand in Bitcoin and I'll return the computer. So I stole Yeah, they you. ransom you. Right. So, yeah. so there's and a then the gray hat difference. in between, I would say, is, is the guy that comes into your store. He steals all the money out of your cash register. But before he walks out, he shows you how he did it and then right. hopes you don't call the cops. Right. And says, I'll give you this back. But I, there's more holes in your business that you're going to want to pay me to find. Exactly. Uh, yeah. I wouldn't recommend black hat or gray hat to anyone. You know, if you're going to do this, do it the right way. There's a lot more money doing this the right way than the wrong way. Trust me. I wanted to ask about that because I, I know some cyber criminals and many of them have gone to jail. I, I never, I wonder when you did the calculation, like, okay, I can do some bad stuff and make money, but there's more money in legitimate business, period. And we see this pretty much universally. Even the Italian mafia now just owns legitimate businesses for the most part, even if they muscle some contract here and there on sanitation, according to some people. It's like, it's, there's still more money just owning a building in Manhattan than trying to extort immigrants or whatever. Right. So... I guess for me, it wasn't really a, a turning point type of decision. It was more of a, you know, once, once I stopped being an idiot kid and, and I stopped using drugs and, you know, I, I started the rehab at such a young age, I, I didn't have time to be an idiot like that. And, and, you know, I, I was doing well financially. So I think it was just kind of the way that God pushed me in my life. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I don't, I can't give you like a turning point because I was never like arrested for a, a, a federal crime or anything of that sort that changed me. Um, I don't know, man. I think I was just, uh, I was just very busy. I was doing well financially and I didn't need to break the law to do that. I love that. But I also, of course, want to hear about some of the black hat stuff, black hat stuff you've done because I can't be the only one admitting crimes and the statute of limitations has long since passed. Yeah, I understand. And, uh, and you know, I can only get into certain things because of some, I guess, credibility and some of the nonprofits that I'm going to be working with that also gotcha. work with federal government. I, I want to make sure that I, I'm a credible person. Yeah, of course. Um, it was the Bitcoin. It was it was a Bitcoin mining botnet. And around that time, it could have been after 2011, maybe 12 or 13. It may, I'm not entirely sure. You know, it was one of those three years. Um, there was these things called Java drive bys. And have you ever heard of a Java drive-by? No. So uh, browsers used to have J Java applets. So you could run, you know, applications in your browser that were Java. 
and it would you'd get a message at the top of your screen and it would say run once or uh you know or run always and there were you know some exploits out there called java drive bys some would mean you know you would you would have to click a button to allow the java applet to run and then others would be you know zero click so they would go to your website and they'd get infected they don't exist anymore because browsers don't support java applets um but I had this website, which I, I won't name the domain name, but I had the website and, you know, it, it looked like they could mine uh, Bitcoin in their browser. And there was a popular Bitcoin forum back then where if you signed up, you know, you'd be considered a newbie member. So anything you said, nobody was going to take seriously. But if you were on there for a while, you had a senior member title. And I wanted to see like, OK, if I can get into one of these senior members accounts, I can post this website infect these computers, which I know if they're all into Bitcoin and Litecoin, they probably have good computers because that's a big factor when it comes to mining. If you have good hardware, your computers are probably going to be good. And, um, you know, I, uh, I took over a couple of these senior accounts, said that this website was legitimate. And, um, you know, that, that botnet spread in the Bitcoin community and it was just mining. It, it had, it's only its sole purpose was to mine um, Bitcoin in a pool. It, uh, it was not like your average Trojan where I was looking through webcams or taking over your, you know, taking over control of your computer or read, you know, I, obviously I could update the file in case I needed yeah. to bypass something. You just some wanted processing of, power. Right, right. So, you know, there was, there was more to the story, but it's, uh, you know, it was a stupid thing that I did. It was, you know, luckily it is past the statute of limitations. It's long gone now, um, but it was... You know, it, I didn't hurt anybody. If anything, I uh, maybe I increased their power bill by a couple pennies. <laughs> you know, but it, it's you know that's that's you know a little a little story from my past, but it doesn't go. You know, a lot of the dumb stuff was before that, even on AIM and and Digital Gangster was another site that I was a big uh, big member of, and you know, just there's a lot of those stories. When you say AIM, are you talking about AOL Instant Messenger? Yep. Wow, that is that's funny. I well. So you admit a crime, I admit a crime. Uh, so I used to, this, I, won't, I probably shouldn't say when this is. Ah, screw yeah. it. In law school, <laughs> <laughs> um, I was like, oh, everyone uses AIM. And everyone, it was like the first year people use laptops. And you're in a law lecture. And I, I was like, what are they talking about? What is everybody talking about? Everyone's using AIM right now. And so I got a Linux partition on my laptop hard drive. And I got some PCMCIA card that, had a Wi-Fi, I threw a good Wi-Fi card in there, and I got something called, like, Air, the logo was a pig. It was, like, Air Oink or whatever. I can't remember the dang thing. Air Snort, maybe. Maybe Air Snort. Hold and on. you ran yeah. the card in promiscuous mode, and it would just grab all the traffic off the network. Yeah, it was Air Snort, and it was uh, it would put the card in monitor mode, and they used to call it promiscuous mode, yeah. I believe. yeah. yeah. And it, yeah, it's it, it was a wireless cracking utility, and uh, back then it was I believe it was WEP keys, which were cracked in seconds. Seconds, yeah, yeah, yeah. Nowadays it's a little different, but it's still, you know it's still easy to to capture a handshake, and you know it's it's a, it's the world hasn't changed much. Yeah. It's just the technology has gotten more advanced. So, so essentially, I was running like man in the middle attacks on my classmates, which is, <laughs> and I'll leave it here, a great way to find out how little people think of you when you can hear their, we see their private conversations. Like, oh my gosh. Yeah, just, I did hear something about you on, uh, on the, on the, uh, Darknet Diaries with you listening to phone calls. Oh yeah. So the, I apparently didn't learn my lesson from the phone calls and just started eavesdropping in my classes and y you won't unsee the unvarnished communication between your classmates about how much of a POS or dork or whatever they think you are. You can't, cause you know, there was no agenda other than just pure, it's like pure truth bomb and it's not what you would, they would never tell you that to your face. So I don't recommend that course of action. It's not good. It's not good for the ego. Uh, and I deserved to take a, I deserved to get knocked down a peg. There's a part of me where I was like, this is, this is the universe being like, Hey, you want to do this kind of crap? Fine. Have a little dose of this. And it's like, Ugh. all right. Right. Uh, maybe, maybe I should stop. So, all right. Bug bounties. I used to just get in trouble for finding bugs in software, but you <laughs> used to get paid. Tell me how that works. Oh, well, you know, bug bounties are kind of a, a blessing for a lot of hackers out there because, you know, most, most large companies now have programs where they'll pay for you to find vulnerabilities. They'll tell you the scope, you know, what, what's in scope, what's out of scope, what, you know, meaning like what not to touch, what to touch. 
And um, depending on the company, they'll pay out for uh, you know big big amounts of money for certain criticalities. So if it's something low informational, um, it might be a hundred dollars. Where if you find something that could damage the company, it could be thirty thousand, a hundred thousand, a million dollars. In in Apple's cases, you know, if you find a, a zero day in an iPhone, it's a million dollar bug bounty. Uh, well, it has to be a. I think it has to be considered a, a zero click exploit, meaning no interaction from the user. But you know, that's a million dollars. Whereas a couple of years or maybe ten years ago, that type of thing would get you put in prison just for just for putting it on the internet. Yeah, there was a lot of like I would crash a BBS, and I remember then being like, oh, I should tell the system, if I liked the board and I crashed it maybe by accident by finding a glitch, I would call the sysop. And I remember one guy called the police instead of just being cool. And I was like, dude, what? I called you to tell you I found a bug and you just try to get me in trouble. Fine, someone else is gonna find the bug and trash your site. And the cops didn't do anything because they were like, uh, so you turned off his computer over the phone? Like, uh, don't do that, kid, you know? And right, was, they don't care. <laughs> yeah, they don't care. And then I was like, oh, well, I'm well, now I'm, what I'm going to do is post the bug on a bulletin board system full of hackers, and I'm going to put your number to your BBS and be like, go ahead and try the bug. It's on this website. You can go ahead, or not website. It's on this bulletin board. You can just log in with a new account and try the ColorWorks bug right now, and it'll crash the whole site. And they had to uninstall that because they were down for days and days because he didn't know it was crashing it every time he would just boot up again somebody would log in five minutes later and crash it and i just thought oh my gosh you know this guy could have just been cool like never piss off hackers even though I, that was the script kitty thing that i had but like why do that just be cool they're trying to help we're trying to help sometimes 100 percent. yeah and and yeah even whether it's script kitty or not that it, it's you know denial of service attacks or as we, that would be considered is you know even if it is the most script kitty attack that i can think of it's one of the most damaging because mm -hmm. it makes your your website, your business, your product unusable right. until that person decides to stop. Yeah, that's yeah, exactly. Exactly. I didn't think of it like that, but yeah, they had to like uninstall that. And the vendor of that, it was a col it was ASCII colors, and the vendor of that ASCII colors program had to write a patch, which they didn't do overnight, right? So they lost, and it's all because some sysop neckbeard guy wouldn't just be like, "Oh, cool, thanks, bro. I'll disable that for now. Thanks." Yep, egos. Yeah. You yeah. gotta you gotta let the ego go. That's that's uh yeah, yeah. totally yeah. agree with you. Uh, now, though, we have the dark web. And can you explain this a little bit? Because I I try to explain onion routing and I just sound like a, do a complete dork. And it's hard. Have you explained well, this before? Whenever I, try I haven't to do it, explained it in okay. technical detail because I, I, I mean, I'm going to look up a, a diagram so that people understand. I can give you like my my explanation of it. But. Yeah, well, while you're looking for that, I'll give my crappy explanation that always confuses people. Basically, the, and correct me where I make a mistake here, but the, basically the military, I think it was, set up a browser that they allow the public to use because the military also uses some of the layers of this network to communicate or get intelligence or whatever. And the more people using it, the more noise there is. And it's essentially all encrypted. And so they want a lot of noise from people who are not doing top secret things. And they want it all heavily encrypted so you don't essentially know what is going on on that internet connection. And then of course, on top of that, you use a VPN to mask your location, ideally. Oh, definitely. I always recommend using a VPN on top of Tor and disabling JavaScript um, if you're using Tor for any reason, even if you're just trying to be anonymous, you don't have to be a criminal to want to be anonymous. Right, so Tor is I'd the web browser that uses the dark, quote unquote, dark web, which uses Yeah, I hate the terminology. I genuinely yeah. hate the dark web, but uh, like the terminology called it's dark dumb. web, because it, it is the onion router. That right. is, it's an open source project that was made for anonymity. That's what it was. And it, you know, criminals exist on the clear web as we're going to get into, and they exist on the dark web, quote unquote. The reason why I bring this up is I think a lot of people, I did an episode a while ago about the Silk Road with an author who wrote a book about the guy who founded the Silk Road, which was essentially a dark web. The way they explain it is not going to be accurate, but it's like Amazon for illegal stuff. And it was like hitmen, drugs, psychedelics, stolen whatever's stolen IP, stolen actual stolen merchandise, stuff like that. It was just a place where you could buy I illegal things using Bitcoin. Yeah, Ross Ulbricht. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah, I actually know Ross's mom, and uh, I I tried to when when um you know I don't know any like I told you before I don't know much about politics, but when Trump was trying trying to uh, I think get reelected, um she was trying to get a pardon for yeah. 
um, like a, I think, is it a pardon when, when they release people from prison? Uh, and, uh, yeah. Or uh clemency maybe. Yeah. Clemency. Yeah. That's what it was. So she was, she was traveling around the country wherever Trump was having rallies. She had, she was getting all these people out, you know, trying to get Ross out of prison. And, you know, I, I don't know. I, I never met Ross. I just, I just uh, ran into his mom and uh, you know, she swears up and down that he never, never hired hitmen or anything like that. He also but, got robbed by, I think, the Secret Service. They took his Bitcoin, didn't they? And they got, that yeah, guy some, got caught and fired. Some government agency stole money in the middle of the investigation. I believe one of them is still uh, locked up to this day. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and Ross got two life sentences, all of his appeals exhausted, um, and he's in no parole. Yeah, it's... Uh... Well, I'll save my opinion, but I think it's a little bit heavy handed for what actually happened, according to the book anyway. Yeah, so. well, I mean, it, I, I, I've been on the Silk Road and I didn't purchase anything on it, but I've been on Silk Road. I've seen how the site works and I understood the concept behind it. It might not have, you know, he, he might have been a very intelligent guy. I don't know if it was just him as like the administrator. He went by Red Pirate Roberts. Um, I don't know if it was just Ross by himself or if it was a bunch of people. The idea was great, except, you know, it got, uh, he, he let people control what was put on the site. He was specifically, you know, you can't, you can't sell weapons here. There were not hitman services on his site, but he was accused of hitman stuff, uh, outside of it. Um, and no child pornography. So there were some rules, but, uh, you know, a lot of stuff on there and mostly drugs and fake IDs, um, hacking services for hire, whether they were real or they were fake, they were there. And, um, a lot of stuff like that, you know, but, but they, there are other marketplaces out there. Uh, I don't know all of them, but I know there was another one called Alpha Bay yep. and the owner of that one got arrested and he didn't get a life sentence because he didn't make it that far. I believe it was the first night or somewhere near the first night he hung himself in his cell. Oh man. Yeah. Yeah. The guy was, uh, you know, living large in in some, uh, Asian country and, um, yeah, he, I think he had a couple of Lamborghinis and a couple of houses and, you know, wasn't very smart about the about making money that way, but he unfortunately killed himself, and he probably probably did because he knew that there was no chance he was ever getting out. Yeah, I gotta. It's interesting to see a pedophile get a certain number of years, or somebody who's done maybe killed someone with actual malice, and then you find somebody who facilitated the selling of mushrooms and other things online granted maybe a lot of times and ends up with a life sentence and dies in prison it's just a little bit like all right are we what are we doing here folks Um, right yeah i can i mean look i'm no lawyer i'm not the law and and i don't advocate for anybody using substances you know but people are going to do what they're going to do people are going to use drugs whether they're illegal or they're not illegal yeah and you know if, if 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 i was still a child doing drugs and i had a choice between buying drugs from Tommy on the corner or buying drugs from somebody where I could read reviews from 10,000 customers. Right. I think I'd pick the one where I knew what I'm getting, you know, and, and, you know, I, I, I'm not saying that what he's doing is all right, but I, I, if I had to choose between the two. I'd pick his, his service. Yeah, I agree. It's a totally different show about law and public policy and, you know, the, the misuse, use or misuse of the internet. But the moral of the story is make your own fake IDs. Don't buy them on the dark web. Um, but no, <laughs> Don't I'm, do that. I'm, no, I'm kidding. Hey, if you like what you're hearing and seeing, check out the Jordan Harbinger Show podcast feed. There's a lot more just like this. You can find the Jordan Harbinger Show in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Now, back to the show. You you showed the Flipper X in a YouTube video and how it works where you're sort of using you, this little device to create men in the middle attacks. You had another device that was a radio hacking device. And the ha- I want- so the Flipper Zero and the Hack R. Oh, Flipper yeah. Zero. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I, I don't have them in my pocket. Oh no, actually, I do have the flipper in my pocket. Just happen oh. to be carrying that with you? That's yeah. that's normal. <laughs> yeah, it's, I'm a I'm a normal guy. Tell us a little bit about that thing. You don't have to demonstrate anything, but I'm curious. Like, I think a lot of people are going, "Wait, you have a hacking device that just happened? You're at home and it's in your pocket? It must be useful." Yeah, it's just chilling in my pocket. But yeah, so this this device is more of a. It, it intrigued me because it it did a lot of things in a small package, you know, and. And uh, for anybody watching on YouTube, it's, it looks it looks like a little little you know, I don't know like a, somebody offered me this. I feel like, like it was toy. on Kickstarter or something. I mean, it was really it like was. kind of widely available. Yeah, anyone right now can purchase one. The thing is that the, they're going to be disappointed when they buy it because it's limited, you know, to what software you're running. And if you don't know 
which type of software and which type of files to load this thing up with, it's, you know, you're very limited to what you, what you can accomplish with it. Um, but, you know, I, I'll go through with the protocols. So it has, it has um, NFC, which is, you know, going to be your, uh, it could be access control or doors. Think it could be, key fobs. Yeah, think key fobs and other things like that. Key fobs, as well as your, uh, as your credit cards and debit cards, they, you know, if they're tapped to pay, uh, they, have, they have EMB, which is, which, you know, this, this can read your credit card and give me your entire credit card number and expiration date. Um, just by waving it across your pocket if you don't have an RFID blocking wallet. Um, so that's, you know, it does NFC, it does RFID, which is similar to NFC in regard to the access control. And um, it's more widely used for access control than NFC. NFC could do more than that. Uh, um, the uh, RFID, I believe, is also what's in your in your dog, if you have a chipped yeah. dog. I think most key fobs, at least the ones that I've used, are also RFID. Those little gray things you use to get into your apartment or whatever. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. We're, yeah. They'll look like a, like a little, they'll look like a credit card, but they'll be blank mm -hmm. to access, you know, it's a fob to get into your building or into, you know, office. Uh, so it has, it has the functionality to not only read them, but to emulate them. So if I, if I go up to you, let's say you have a fob that gets into your office and I copy that fob with the, with the flipper, I can then emulate that same fob at your office and your door will think I'm you. And that, you know, it doesn't, it's a very low skill attack, but you know, this device is, widely available and you're you're as dangerous as the software uh that it, you know that you install on it and so you, that you have those two things and you have sub gigahertz which is uh i believe it's with the firmware that i'm using it's 300 megahertz to 900 megahertz which is enough of a range to do car key fobs garage doors gates um you know a lot of the you know, even intercoms at uh, Walgreens, CVS, Lowe's. Oh, really? Could, intercoms? Start, I, didn't, you know, I didn't think about that. That's funny. Well, you know, you think the buttons in the aisles where you're, where you're requesting oh, assistance. Oh, yeah, sure. So you would capture the, the frequency with this device. Um, you would, you know, basically you're, you're recording it almost like it's, a, like, you're, it's, like it's a microphone for radio. You're recording that signal and then you're replaying it later on. And if it's a static signal like it is at, it, let's say, a CVS in the cough and cold department. I got a cold right now, so that's where I'd be going. I'd click the button, I'd ask, you know, I'd, and then someone would come, but the intercom would say, assistance needed in the cough and cold department. But at that time, I'd be holding the flipper up to that device, I'd capture the signal, replay it, and then the intercom would do the same thing as if I pressed the button. That's funny. So you just walk into CVS and you're like, I know I'm going to need them to unlock the cold medicine. So as soon as you walk in, you hit the thing in your pocket and stroll right over there and the guy's waiting for you. Exactly. Or, you know, there's there's some files out there like, you know, if you want to be uh, if you want to be kind of a like a nuisance, there's, you know, CVS chaos, Walgreens chaos, Lowe's chaos, where where it takes every single button in the store and some that don't even exist at certain locations. And the intercom just goes. Da ding, da ding, da ding, da ding, oh, da, ding no. da ding, and some of the buttons they can't go over to deactivate because the buttons don't exist in the store. Oh no! But it's they're right all using in the, the system that they have, but the button's not active, but it still can right. take a signal. Oh god! Yeah, so the employees are like, "We don't even have a cosmetics department in here. Like, why? Mm. I don't know how to turn it off." So then they they probably have to go into the back to turn yeah. it off. So that, oh, it does that. It it does infrared, which you know it'll get you know TVs and air conditioners. Uh, sound bars, DSLR cameras, anything that uses infrared, which you'd be surprised, a lot of things do. It can not only read and copy an infrared remote, but replay the signals a lot stronger than your average remote. So it does that as well as um, uh, other access control stuff. Um, do you remember the TV? There was a device, not not quite like this, but there was a device that... TV be gone. Yeah. That's funny. It read my mind. Wow, that device really can do a lot of things. Uh, uh, no, that uh, the, the TV be gone. Yeah, you'd push the button and it would just send like a universal. It would, I guess, cycle off for five hundred different TV models and turn off and all so the TVs. This. So this, by but when you buy, even if you buy this out of the, you know, off the website, you leave it with the stock firmware on it. It does have a universal TV remote where it cycles through all the major brands, and you could turn the TV off go through the volume, mute the TV, change the channel. It has that built into it by default. So yeah. it, sports like you could be chaos. a nuisance. Yeah, sports bar chaos. But when you start to put custom firmware, I'll, I'll give you one example. Um, there's, there's a specific type of firmware you can put on here that... Uh, by the I, way, you firmware click is it. software for chips, like semiconductors. So people are like, what is that? It, it just think software and you'll be fine with the following the conversation. Yeah. 
Just ones and zeros. Yeah. So the the correct amount of ones and zeros goes into this device, and then there's there's a version uh, that you know if you press your garage door opener, and normally that code would be a rolling code. So a rolling code changes every single time that you press the button. So your garage door is expecting that next code. So let's say you're in your driveway, you press your garage door button, and the code is one two three four five six. The garage door says, "Okay, that's a valid code. I'm going to open." But now one two three four five six is no longer a valid code. One two three four five seven is a valid code, and that's the next one in the sequence. But you know it's a little more complex than that. But if you get my point, it changes every time you press that button. Right, cars use well, that and stuff now, or they're supposed to. Exactly. Well, some key fobs do that, and uh, and garage doors do that, and many things use rolling code systems. But a few of the major brands like Security Plus, I believe one point oh two point oh, and I think it's Came C A M E. Um, have been broken by some firmwares on this di- device specifically. So if I capture one of your garage door uh, attempts, one of your, when you press the button, I capture it. I now know the next sequence. I know, you know, forever. So the, I can continue to open your garage over and over and over again with just one capture. The, the way that you would kind of know somebody's doing that to you is if they open your garage door and you click your button, your garage door doesn't open. You know that it's out of sync by one. Right. You click it two times, then it starts to work, and you know that it's out of sync by two. If I open your garage door five times with this device, then you got to click your your garage door opener six times for it to be back in sync. If that makes sense. It does. That's very interesting. That's how you interesting that that's how you would tell. I know back when I lived in Hollywood, there was a notice kind of going around. We didn't have next door or whatever, but there was a Facebook group, and it was like, hey don't park your car in your driveway, which is impossible because people don't have big garages, especially in the Hollywood Hills. But there was this gang of, uh, it turned out to be like Russian gangster kids. They would ride around in Range Rovers. They, you'd see them on surveillance cameras. They would stop and park and suddenly like a BMW door, trunk, whatever would open and the guy would run in, ransack the car and leave. And the, he had a device, there was somebody in the car with a laptop and a, or whatever, some sort of device that would just go through and try every possible code for the fobs, whatever, the, the RFID, whatever it was That would be considered a brute force attack. Yeah, it was a so brute they would, force they would, attack, yeah. They would know the right frequency to send, on, you know, they would know they would know exactly what to send and then they would loop through, let's just say it was a, an 8-bit, um, you know, code and they would just go through each one until it opens. And there's a more advanced way of explaining it. There's a thing called like a De Bruyne sequence that, um, you know, would make that time a little bit fast. Well, a lot faster than going just one, two, three, four. Um, you know, that's a little more technical. If you're interested, look into look into roll jam attacks, which is how you can abuse rolling codes without having to actually crack the rolling code. Um, look into they're called roll jam attacks. And if you're interested in the De Bruyne sequence, there's something cool by a hacker, Sammy Camcar who made this awesome kid's toy into a garage door <laughs> opening ma- garage door opening machine. Um, That's so funny. Super interesting stuff. You should check it out. That's just, hackers, man, are so interesting. I remember uh, one of the talks at DEF CON, again, this is probably like almost 10 years ago now, maybe even more. The, there was a guy who had a similar looking radio device and it some it could broadcast aircraft IDs. Well, it could read and broadcast aircraft IDs. Yeah, so my my hacker ref does the same thing, and that, oh, okay. that's uh, it's called an ADSB. Uh, so ADSB is the is what you would be receiving on, um, and it will give you the call sign of the airplane. It'll give you their altitude. It'll give you the location on the map, and um, it, you know there there's an option as well to transmit ADSB, which is you know not legal. I'm could, guessing it's definitely not legal whatsoever because you could you could represent to let's say like I live near an airport, so. A small plane could believe that you are at whatever altitude with this call sign going in this direction, and you could cause a problem. You know, it's that's kind of dangerous. But uh, it's something like that is available for some anybody to do if they have the right knowledge or you know they spend some time trying to learn how to do that stuff. So one of the talks at DefCon was a guy who a hacker saying, "Hey, you, we got to be careful because." I got an antenna in this device and this, I don't know, it was like he laid up on top of Google Maps or MapQuest or whatever was available at the time. And he's like, look, here's all the planes in the area. And he's like, what if we simulate by spoofing two or three or 23 planes that aren't there and we put them near an airport? It's pure chaos. 
What happens if we do that and we put them near buildings? This is after September 11th, of course. You cause massive terror. Okay, now what happens if I put them heading towards the White House? And it's like, now we have a military response, potentially, or at least they're going to have to make sure that those are that that's an error and those aircraft are not actually there. But it, it's, I mean, sp speak, talk about terrifying huge numbers yeah, it's, of people. It's, yeah, it, you, you could cause mass panic with such a such a small, simple, easy to set up thing that, you know, a consumer can buy. And, uh, you know, it's not really talked about often and I'm not going to explain how to do it either. But, uh, you know, it's it is scary to know that there is, you know, these, there's criminals out there that, that don't know much about computers and, and can take this interview. They'll do some, their own research. And I hope that they, uh, that, you know, that they, they don't figure out how to do stuff like that. Yeah. Because, you know, I, I'm it's... thinking, look, most of the people who are creative, smart enough to figure reverse engineer what we're talking about are people who could either figure it out on their own or are going to have better thing, hopefully better things to do than that. Uh, I would hope so. Yeah, yeah. I would hope so. Because again, I, b I believe that you're right there too. I mean, most of the yeah. time, the, the smartest people that I know are not crim criminals. No, and, I, and there's more. Yeah. There's more money to be made in legitimate operations. And if you really want to be kind of criminal, join the freaking NSA already. Because then at <laughs> yeah, least you're yeah, going to get, get permission. Right, you get permission. At least you won't go to prison. Speaking of which. What do you think? I've got friends who work in it, really big companies that I can't name, and I they work in the security departments of, ooh, I almost said something that made it really obvious, whatever operating systems their devices use. And I said, who's your biggest, what's your biggest sort of a, a attacker right now? And they're like, well, I can't tell you. And I'm like, does it rhyme with Iran and China? And they're like, okay, fine. You know, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure that out. And one of the things that they're worried about or that this this particular guy is worried about is they're seeing a lot of attacks from things that are not people's computers. They're getting attacked from thermostats, vacuum cleaners, um, you know, like iRobot I type thing. Think basically IoT, Internet of Things devices that have been compromised in some way, usually made in China. Uh, maybe they're in use in Eastern Europe or something. Like usually they're lower grade versions, not the brand names that we maybe have. That's so I, the problem. I mean, yeah. I, I don't mean to cut you off, no. but just, just so I don't forget, I I, uh, I have this Pinnacle mop and mop and vacuum that you know it's a combination of two, and it's it is I believe one of the best brands. It's sold in Best Buy. It's actually behind me right now. It connects to your, to your home network. It uh, communicates with a Chinese cloud server for not only Why? just the. I don't know. And uh, I proxied the traffic from it, which means just, you know, intercepted the traffic between that device's app and my computer so I could see where, you know, sure. what was going on. And, um, you know, you would think something just simple as changing the volume on that device would be on the device. Well, it actually sends it to this Chinese cloud server, and then that sends it to the vacuum. So right now, everything is, is fine. There's no problem, but, it, you know, it's just everything is being sent back and forth to this cloud server if I was to connect it back to the internet. But at any moment, if somebody changes that, now somebody has a direct, you know, pivot point on my home network, um, you know, and it, start, it, can, it can be your vacuum mop, you know, that you have no clue. It just says, hey, connect me to your network and let me update myself or connect me to your network to activate your warranty or do whatever it may be. And you, you put this device in your corner and you may not ever think about it, but it might just be, as, as Jordan just said, it could be, it could be um, a thermostat, it could be a smart outlet, it could be anything yeah. at all. And those devices could be a point for an attacker or even a nation state actor in a different country or even our own country, who knows, um, to pivot throughout your home network and see what you're doing. So my vacuum being one of them. <laughs> yeah, of course. I've got a buddy who's like a, I guess you'd call him a high value target for certain people. And he ha has cybersecurity experts that he hires because of that. And they found that I don't even know what this thing was. Something that goes on your garden hose. I, it's for gardening. It's literally like a water, like a smart faucet. That okay. was compromised. And okay. they're That's like... That's enough, you know? Yeah, and it, it, what was funny is he's like, yeah, I mean, I, I don't have too much faith in these guys. I mean, they only hacked my garden faucet, and I, I, I had to sort of stop him. I was like, hey, man, I'm pretty sure that that's just like the jumping off point for the rest of your network in your house. They probably had physical access to that thing somehow by walking. I don't know. Maybe they trespassed and even 
got near it, whatever. Or maybe it was exposing something to the internet. Yeah. Or, yeah. Who knows what it was? Or maybe, yeah, like you said, physical access, maybe they factory reset it, right. connected to it. Like you're not going to well, laugh. Well, I guess when maybe, well, if you're... they did that, then they wouldn't have. Right. right. If, yeah. yeah. But I, who knows Who knows how they got access to it? But, uh, it's all yeah, fun it's, and games it, until your your cameras inside your house are broadcasting to your smart faucet and then sending that to a cloud server in China. Then you're not laughing at lunch. Right, and, and that can happen at any moment. So it's I'm not trying to instill fear in anyone, it's, but it's true. So it's it's hard to, you know, I'm telling you the truth. And it's uh, one of those things where, like, when I saw the traffic being proxied, I was like, okay, this is kind of cool. I could start the smart cleaning from my phone. I could do all that. But why not just keep it on my local network? Why does it need to be on some cloud server? Why do I need to be able to see the stats for my mop uh, from the office? Um, there's just no reason for it. So it, maybe they're a great company. Maybe they have no bad intentions at all. But if they get, let's say, let's say they have all great intentions and then somebody compromises them. And now every single person that has this specific brand, Tinico, uh, not every single person is a target and their home networks are easily pivotable if they, for some reason, could get a what they call a shell on that device. Um, and they could scan my other network, look for other device, the rest of my network and look for other devices on it and try to pivot from the mop to another device, the same way from the garden hose to a computer or the garden hose to a smart uh, outlet and then from a smart outlet to a computer. Who knows what, what you know path that person takes, but it, it's doable. It's even been done in casinos. There was a uh, I believe it was a, a thermostat in a fish tank, right? That got, oh, did you yeah. hear about that? I think I did yeah. hear about that. I don't know the story, though. Do you? No, I don't know the full story, but I know that, that it got hacked and they used it for some some way, some, you know, some way nefariously. Wow. A thermostat, yeah, a thermostat in a fish in a, tank. Right, in a fish tank. Incredible. I, yep. I think that the IoT stuff is so interesting the internet of the, like the nest thermostats and the smart robots and the because everything is going in that direction and security is expensive nobody's trying to secure those devices because it's exp why spend the extra money to have the guy write secure code it's like an afterthought especially and look even if u.s companies or western companies start doing that do you think that the company that knocks this thing off that ends up being the cheaper one that sells two million on amazon are they going to give a crap about that no I don't, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I doubt it. I mean, it, like, yeah, I, I guess you know, without going into a million details about it, owning a cybersecurity company and uh, and seeing this stuff every day, I, I get to see all these gaping vulnerabilities. You know, sometimes it's low hanging fruit. Sometimes it's you know massive. You know, massively. Uh, you know, exploit. It was, sometimes I am trying to explain this, but like a, a massively exploited flaw in a lot of systems. Sometimes it's something like that, and sometimes it's very complex attacks. Um, but seeing it at my company, sometimes it's as easy as, for example, like we have a, a tool called Darkwatch, where you could put in your personal email address um, or, or your employees if you wanted to look and see which passwords are out there um, on the quote unquote dark web um, from public databases. Um, but they're, you know, a collection of 140 billion different records. So, you know, you put your Gmail in there, you put your, put your, your business email, whatever you choose. Uh, it's going to come back with your passwords, your some sensitive info. Sometimes it's your address. It could be your social. It could be your credit card. And uh, there's nothing that, uh, as a company, that we can do to to get rid of that data. But at least you know you could change that password. You know, try to protect your identity the best way that you know how. And what we offer, which we you know is something we do privately, is if you want your information removed publicly, we can help you with that. But when it comes to these collections of databases. Um, we, we can't remove them. They're not ours. You know, we, we just have a collection of them that you can, you can search yourself. And um, same goes for your face. So we have another thing, which is important because this is going to go into the next topic. Sure. Um, the, we have a, a tool called Identity IQ where you can upload a picture of your face. And like, you know, I could take a screenshot or take a picture of your face right now. It's never been on the internet before. It'll measure 120 plus points of your face. And it'll use that uh, against a, a large database of, of, you know, other faces and find, you know, find you all over the internet with links to where you're at. And sometimes that data is valuable for, for, for a business owner or for an individual because they want to know where they're being posted. And sometimes like a, one example that I've used before is you could be in the background at a sporting event, not knowing that you, a picture was taken of you. And now you know that you are, you know, letting people know that you live in this town because you're supporting this little, you know, little league baseball team and you're in the back and you're this little speck in the corner. But um, it's important to just scan and see what's out there because otherwise you won't know. 
that's that, you know that's pentester.com there there're just some widgets that I I'll, I'll save all the hassle and of talking about the vulnerability scanning and keeping your company safe but the two widgets themselves I believe are valuable for any person or you know you know we we have a discount if you reach out to us but it's 50 bucks to sign up and, yeah, uh, let's put a link in the show notes with a little discount. Can we do that? Can we arrange? Yeah, yeah, that? yeah, for sure. I can give you a, I can give you a code for sure, and uh, you know, we'd be, we'd be happy because we, we do individuals and businesses, and it, just like I said, dark watch, looking up your email, and identity IQ, looking up your face. Those two things alone are worth you, you checking yeah. out what's out there. And that's not just me because I want to promote the business no, 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 because I, I genuinely believe you you should. It, it would be scary if my face wasn't all over the Internet for obvious reasons. But I think if you told that to like my dad or my wife, she's not going to be thrilled for me. I'm like, great. I hope it's in 100,000 different places. Right. Because I've got all kinds of stills. I mean, I have Google alerts set up for my name just to make sure that the stuff out there is true or not, whatever. And but I've thousands of pictures on the internet, of course, in, in videos. But for I think for a normal person who's in a normal line of work, it's probably quite unnerving to see you pop up all over. And sometimes it's probably terrifying. I mean, if you popped up on some kind of weird forum and it's you sunbathing and it's fr taken from a drone or something, now you're like really freaking oh, out. Oh yeah, that stuff is, is definitely possible. And then there's people that use photos of you on other websites to sell products. And you may have no clue. You, you could be on some Russian website that's selling uh, dishwasher fluid. Oh. And you have no clue, you know? Yeah, that's funny. That happened to a friend of mine. She went to Brazil and she was getting some ice cream. It's Vanessa Van Edwards. She's been on the show. She's on YouTube and a podcast author. She went to go buy ice cream and she's like, wait a minute. And she took a photo and it's her on the ice cream freezer, but oh it's from her God. book. They just cut it out and they put it on there like, Ooh, ice cream instead of, you know, like body language. Yeah, exactly. So That's exactly funny. my point. And it's just, it, there's so many examples of that, but it's, it's just important to check it out. Yeah. I mean, I would be flattered if I ended up on an ice cream container, but yeah, yeah. me too, me too. But you know, and not if, everybody wants to be out there that's like true. that. It's my interface. Most people don't through. want to be out there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, true enough. Well, all right. It's a good time to pivot then to, well, how, no need to sugarcoat it. You hacked a pedophile website. Tell me about this. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I uh, got a bunch of data from a pedophile website that I was alerted about from um, a friend of mine's wife. She texted me and said, you know, she sent me some horrible screenshots of some forum posts. One of them uh, was including, you know, a father that had his his child in the bathtub, you couldn't see, you know, the child naked, but you could, you could tell that they were, um, like they were like their back was, I guess, looking forwards. And they said, uh, it said in the title, um, they have no idea what's going to happen to them tonight. And underneath of it was other people saying what they were going to do to this person's child. And, uh, I left where I was at. There was like, there was more screenshots than that, which I, you know, I'll get into them if you want me to read them. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I left where I was at and I went home and I didn't know exactly what I was going to do. Obviously, I just knew that I needed to do something, whether it be report this website, uh, some, start a, a petition, you know, on change or which change.org is just a place where you can you know, sign petitions for things that you care about. After she sent those messages, I, I went home and, uh, and did everything that I possibly could to find a way, you know, to take this thing down. And, you know, I'll leave the, 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 the ways that I did it out. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I didn't know about the site prior. I, you know, I had, I've never seen anything like this in my life. But when I did see the forum post there, there was no, it was, this was on the clear web, by the way. So like anyone could visit the site. You didn't need an account to, to access any of the data. I believe you needed an account to access any of the private messages, you know, like any other website, but everything was publicly facing. And you could see this very large group of pedophiles. And after uh, you know, after I did some digging and I and I found my way into their server, um, I installed a few backdoors. And my first uh, my first thought was, okay, well, I don't want to download this whole site. I don't want to yeah. download images because I don't want to be in possession of CSAM or child pornography. Mm -hmm. um, I want to download all of the users out of the database. But that is as far as I'm going to go. I'm going to take the you know the identifying details, which includes their emails and usernames and more. And uh, I'm going to reach out to the government and uh, they're going to come in my brain. If this is what I'm thinking at the time, the government's going to come. They're going to take these back doors that I have because they have no idea they were compromised at this point, at least that I was aware of. 
and they're going to take over these back doors and they're going to grab all this information themselves. But I'm going to notate everything with timestamps and this and that. And if I get in trouble for this, then, uh, you know, it is what it is. I was doing it to protect the children. And, uh, it, you know, I, I'll get into the details of the site, but the, you know, I wasn't really scared of getting in trouble at that time. It was more of like, this needs to go. This website is so bad and it needs to go. I'm going through the users that I dumped and the first user, uh, user ID one, which is the administrator of the site, used his personal Gmail address. Wow. And yeah. And his name was Nathan Larson, who was a politician. And uh, I found that by Googling him and he ran for Congress twice. And uh, I believe, you know, you could fact check this, but I believe at one point he got 2% of the vote in Virginia, which wow. I know 2% is not a big number, but it's a big enough number for this guy. He was, he was publicly a pedophile publicly pro-incest, publicly against women, um, publicly a white supremacist. Like, if you you name it, this guy was it. Wow, he was he's the like worst a collector of terrible titles. Yeah, and not only that, but he, I think at one point, he sent a letter or, or email or saying, saying he was going to kill the president. He did time for that. Wow. Like, this guy just overall was, like, a horrible person. So when I, when I seen him in the database of running the site, I reported that immediately. I got my tip line number. You can see that on Project Veritas. They, they have a screenshot of my original tip to uh, the, the um, cybertip.org, um, which I believe is, is uh, the NICMIC, like uh, National Missing Exploited Children. Um, so I reported it there, and I really, in my brain, I'm believing they're going to knock on my door and, and you know, gather this data, and they're going to be just as, as uh, antsy as I am to get this thing taken down, because not only was there because there are uh, pedophiles on here, there were children, or at least people claiming to be children. At the, in my brain, I'm thinking, okay, there's kids on here trying to sell their bodies to these people. This needs to go. Um, and uh, you saw kids you know, on there basically prostituting themselves, or yeah, trying yeah, to. Yeah, yeah. Which you know, like I said, I can, I can read you the, some of this stuff. Like I have one here. It says, "Hello, guys. I'm a 16 year old boy from Iceland who wants to sell pics or videos of me doing anything you want me to do. Send me a DM if you're interested." And the title of the the forum post was 16 year old boy selling pics for vids. So who knows if this was really a 16 year old or not at that time, mm -hmm. but I'm reading stuff like that and many more. This is just one I just picked. I have some open in preparation to the show, but that stuff made me very sick to my stomach knowing the kids are being exploited and victimized, whether they know it or not. Um, but like, you know, going back into what I'm saying here, I was really under the impression that the government was going to just show up or call me or do something to, to take this thing down and nothing happens. So I was like, okay, well, then I'm going to go to the media. I'm going to make this public and I'm going to force, force their hand, basically, is what I felt at that time. And, the, you know, I talked to countless, you know, media people and all of them seemed very interested in running the story. I didn't have a single one that actually answered it. I probably spoke to 12, 13 different, different news agencies. And uh, if you want me to tell you the specifics, I will. But it's, uh, I talked to a lot of them and... All of them were interested in running the story and all of them had the exact same response. And it was that uh, they couldn't run the story because their legal team was not OK with wow. it. Wow. And I was like, OK, well, if you can't run the story with the with what you guys are considering the illegal, the, the illegally obtained uh, material, like the usernames and the emails. Um, and just let parents know that this site exists. If you see your kids on this website, get them off of the site and uh, they still wouldn't run the story. So I was so pissed off. You know, I, at this point, I was incredibly angry that nobody wanted to do anything. I called my lawyer. My lawyer reported it to the task force. I called a lawyer in Virginia. That's where the owner of the site, Nathan Larson, lived. I tried to figure out what their recommendation was. She didn't have anything that she could offer to me. Um, I, uh, I, I just, I ran out of options eventually where there was just like, I can't do anything. Mm -hmm. And all I can do is sit here and wait and hope that somebody's going to show up. Well, I waited six months and I see on the news, Nathan Larson's arrested. And I'm thinking, oh, great. They finally they, did something. They did that, some, yeah. Right. So I look at these, these articles and they don't bring up the website. They don't bring up anything about that. They just bring up the fact that he kidnapped a 12 year old girl and, you know, I allegedly raped her. And, um, you know, I, that's the one that he got caught with, you know, that's, that's, you know, six months prior, I don't know how long he was, he's been a pedophile or was a pedophile. Um, but, uh, that's the one he was caught raping or caught kidnapping. Wow. Um, there, there's, I'm sure I, I could, I could say with confidence that this guy has, has done worse. Um, 
you know, you, know, you don't just get caught on your first your first time doing anything. Right. So I, I, you know, whatever the case was, I believe that could have been stopped if I would have just been heard. And I and I understand the government a lot more than I did at that time. Now, um, it's just slow process, and the tip lines are just blasted with tips all day long. And you know, the it's you know maybe maybe they did see it, maybe they were investigating it. I don't think I'll ever know. Uh, but you know, I at that time I really was upset with the government, so I took it in my own hands and I started to look for groups out there that were helping you know expose these people. And, um, you know, I, I, if you want, you know, I can talk about that right now. Yeah, yeah, continue yeah. reading about the site. I, I'm, I'm still, I'm curious a little bit about the site because there's the one offending image, but I assume when you went in there, you came across, and I know you didn't export this or peruse the materials much. You mostly went for the users. Uh, and the, the, we'll link to the Project Veritas video on the, in the show notes where they track down one of the users and he admits everything on camera, which is crazy. Um, Oh yeah, just uh, that's one of many. But yeah, it's one of thousands one. of guys on there, right? And but this no, guy, well, one of function. many that have been confronted already. Yeah, I, I mean, see. Okay, interesting. Yeah, I mean, this guy, he is a sort of a pathetic soul. He just like had a non-functional life, um, porn addiction, but like OCD to the point of. I think there was a quote from the video where he said he can't even brush his teeth because yeah, he's just like, yeah, he's so obsessed with watching <laughs> porn that he uh, that. He can't even brush his teeth, literally, like not even, not even uh, figuratively. Yeah. He, he literally is that addicted to porn. But either way, it's, it's no excuse to be looking at and soliciting children. No, for, of course. No. You know, for photos. No. So, so and, what, uh, what else did you find on the, on the site? I mean, how did, how did you know that wasn't like, oh, this is 4chan, someone's trolling, LOL. The uh, absolutely. End. Because, you know, I got a picture I'm looking at right now. And the title is, like, do you want me to? graphic yeah here? yeah so pause now if you have kids in the car even though i warned everybody at the top of these shows that it, not to have kids in the car uh but yeah if you're and if you're listening in public pause this now because people are going to give you side eye once they hear this. oh yeah absolutely yeah definitely definitely pause it or wait till later to, to listen to the rest of this so um this title was um in the category of jb pill which i learned recently means jailbait pill and Jailbait means kids. Mm -hmm. The title of the post is Who Wants to Anally Gangbang These Little Sluts? Oh, and the, the content of it says, I've got first dibs on the little whore in the middle. And then it says, at Joseph Fritzel, who was Nathan Larson, that was the name, one of the two names he went by on the site. Uh, he said, pick a whore for yourselves. And it's a picture of three little girls in bathing suits holding hands. Oh, man. Mm -hmm. By the way, do you know who that, Joseph Fritzel one of is? is? Do you know who that is? I do. I don't. So I'm nine. I better Google this, but I'm 99% sure you probably heard about this. There was a guy in Austria and it, they found that he had dug out his basement and he had given, he put his daughter in there and she had given birth to like five kids and they'd never been out of the basement ever. Oh my gosh. Man. Yeah. And so they caught him and he had like this elaborate underground network. And I guess his wife, or somebody else was like, I just never knew it was there because he had the always secret work down in this basement and he had like multiple fake door. I'm just horrifying. Is there a movie about that? I think I may have seen something uh, like that a while ago. I mean, it's something, something straight out of it. Saw, but no, I don't know. Probably. It's just horrific. So he yeah, that picked, is horrific. He picked that name for, for some reason. Maybe he admired this guy given his own proclivities. I Ugh. mean, the guy, the guy is absolutely disgusting. And, uh, and even though, you know, it's, yeah, which you know, I don't want to give away what I'm about to say. So I'll, I'll, I'll wait a second on that. But uh, I'll read you another post here that was horrible. How to coax daughter without it being weird or her telling mommy. So my, the guy says, so my daughter, 13 years old, is into anime and all of that. And I have her on weekends, dot, dot. I know she is interested in sex, but how do I coax her into us playing together without it making our relationship weird or her running back to her mother and telling her or anyone else for that matter. And someone replies and says, what anime does she like? Oh, man. And he says, not really sure. She writes her own stories. And that was uh, the end of that screenshot, but I'm sure that went on. Right. This was all, like I said, publicly accessible oh, for anybody God. to read on the clear web for anybody, uh, whether it be kids, adults, pedophiles, anybody could have seen this content. Oh, God. It's so gross. And you know it exists because you hear about it, but you don't really, we don't hear these kinds of details. And I've, I've seen 
a very small amount of child abuse material. It's horrible. I have nightmares about it. To clarify, this wasn't something I was looking for. It wasn't like on a website I was looking at. This is something I saw under very specific circumstances that I can't get into, but suffice to say, I would love to unsee it, to unsee it if I could. And that was, I saw one image that was displayed to me for a moment by accident. And afterwards I had to ask the investigators because that was the circumstance. I was like, hey, I saw that out of like the corner of my eye briefly and you look at this stuff all day, you know, are you, are you okay? And they're not okay. These guys are no, not I, okay. I can understand why they wouldn't be okay. And I'm not even looking at what they're looking right. at. I'm just reading about what these people talk about. Like I'll read you one more because it's upsetting me to even talk about. Um, the title of this is a five-year-old undressed before my eyes. And the guy says, it happened earlier in this year. No one else was around, and it could have been the perfect opportunity. But the situation was so unexpected and absurd, and, and my inhibition so strong that I couldn't bring myself to act. I have masturbated furiously to this memory ever since for many months, and I and hit myself for not having the strength of mind. I have developed myself greatly since, and positive that I could do something now if another opportunity came. Then Joseph Fritzel replies you know, Nathan Larson, uh, and says, your only hope is to redeem yourself by creating another such opportunity and acting upon it this time. Otherwise, this memory will torment you forever. And um, oh my just to God. clarify to some, to some of you guys, um, I'm reading you stuff about Nathan Larson, but there's roughly, you know, a little over 7,000 people on this website um, that are not Nathan Larson, mm -hmm. that are as bad as him. Um, I'm just reading you the stuff that's a lot more public. and. Uh, it's it's not just him that's bad. There's a lot of yeah. a lot of bad people here, and um, and to also to address another thing just before I forget it, um, a lot of people are commenting on my pages and commenting on these videos, and I'm sure they'd be commenting on yours if I don't say this. People are saying, "Well, release the database, release it." Like we we want it. Well, you know, I made a good decision, I believe, a couple of years ago to not release this publicly because. My original reason was because uh, there was this website called Ashley Madison where there were, you know, husbands and wives oh, yeah. cheat on each other. And not that I'm in support of that by any means, because I'm not married. I've never been married. Uh, but, I, you know, wh that website got hacked, got breached, and uh, a lot of data got out there. And a lot, it broke up a lot of marriages. But more importantly, people killed themselves because they were on that website. Yeah. And I had a friend who, who uh, you know, was on that site, just curious, an internet marketer guy who exactly. was curious to see how their site was going. And he wasn't even married at the time. And uh, his, his email is still in the database. His work email is in the database. And his wife knows that it had, it, he, he wasn't even married to her at that time. It, had, it made no sense. But, you know, there was people that died because that list was released. And uh, they killed themselves. So I didn't release it for that reason back then. And now going through this database with Project Veritas and finding out that there's a strong, uh, I'm sorry, a large number of people in this list that were actually children, like they were really kids, not just portraying kids or role playing children. Like some, some of them are 18 now and I, and the data was from 2020. Oh, I see. So, so right. Oh, I know for sure they're that they victims, were victims and you might yeah. dox them and then they look like pedophiles and their lives are ruined. And they were already obviously hurting when they were on this website in the first place. 100%. And, and I have an entire Telegram export. Uh, they had this public Telegram that if you, were, if you were on the site, you could find a link to it where you could see all them talking to each other, referring to child porn as cheese pizza and pizza. And they would refer people that, that take photos of child porn as cooks or chefs and uh, all these, you know, stupid term and all, terms that I'm learning more about because we're investigating it. But um. I joined that telegram without them knowing, you know, with an anonymous account. I didn't never interact it in there um, in the public chat. But uh, I, I exported all of their, their chats that just, you know, as evidence if, they, if the government needed it. And I saw that there was a person on there named Cherry, a username named Cherry. that was a moderator that if you sent them uh, pornography, that they would invite you to another like telegram child abuse group. material, to be pretty clear, right? I also have conflated yeah. those terms, but... Not just any, yeah, just the gross stuff, not the, not the, not the any type stuff. of CSAM. Right. Yeah. To prove that you're not an officer, to prove, you know, whatever gotcha. their, their rules were, you had to send CSAM, child abuse material, to a user named Cherry, who is one of the, I believe, two moderators, if I'm not mistaken. And Cherry would then let you into another Telegram group, which I presume had 
some really bad stuff in it. I just didn't get there because number one, I didn't have CSAM. And number two, I, even if I had, I don't have, the, I, my, it, it just doesn't sit right with me to even, even, even look at that stuff. I don't know. I, I can't, well, yeah. I, just, I couldn't do of it. I, I just, you know, I, I think I had enough with what I did. Um, and I find out now a couple of years, almost three years later, that Cherry was a child. Oh, so wow. Cherry was a victim herself. And she was the gatekeeper to this horrible community that I presume existed. How? Can't, I just can't even imagine. I would not have imagined that underage, that actual children were also running child sexual abuse material websites. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean... I don't know how, how it's going to go with the whole Cherry situation. We do know who, what her real name is now. Um, you know, I, I don't know exactly how we're going to go about it. She's, I definitely am not going to expose her. Um, I, you know, whether she was doing something horrible to somebody or not, she was a kid, and kids can't make decisions for themselves. That's why, that's why there is an age of consent, right. and you know, that's, it, that's why they're kids. They're not adults. So if anything, I would reach out to her or have you know, somebody that's trustworthy, reach out to her for information rather than uh, expose. I wouldn't, I, I have no interest in trying to ruin a kid's life. It, you know, maybe, maybe they're a predator still, maybe they're a pedophile. So who knows what they are, but it, you know, that they'll, they'll, they'll be found eventually. You know, I'm not, I don't want to be a part of destroying a child's life in any regard. So where's Nathan Larson now? People are probably Nathan wondering. Larson is dead. Thankfully. <laughs> He, uh, when he got arrested with that 12 year old, he went to federal prison. And according to the news, he died from self starvation, which I find very hard to believe personally. Um, be hard very to do hard, that. Yeah, very hard to kill yourself, you know, by not eating. Just being starving by itself has got to be very difficult. Um, so let's just say you're locked in a cell. I would assume with his charges, he was in protective custody of some sort. And in protective custody, you're fed by inmates. To, to my knowledge, which they'd be considered trustees in certain prisons. And they may have starved him to death. And I believe if the prison knew that this quote unquote politician, um, you know, was being starved to death or was, or was refusing to eat one or the other, they would have put him in a padded room and mm -hmm. jammed a, a tube down his throat and forced him to eat. So they didn't get sued over it. Um, but, you know, they, they can say suicide. I'm not going to believe that personally. That's up to you to decide. But either way, the man's dead and I'm not losing sleep over it. And, um, you know, that's that was that was his justice. But there's a lot more justice to be served. And uh, and luckily, you know, I, I can't talk about it specifically, but, you know, law enforcement is involved now and things are being taken care of. Yeah, I think it's it really is shocking that it took so long. And I, like you said, I get it. The tip lines are full. They don't know about the credibility. There's chain of custody evidence stuff. But when I told my buddy, who was a former federal prosecutor about what you had well before when we first talked, he's like, yeah, I would investigate that immediately. So he was mystified as to why no other DA took that up or a USA took that yeah. up. Yeah. Nobody, nobody, uh, nobody did. And then, it took, I guess, going viral a couple times um, for for uh, for people to take me seriously. But Man. You know, it it is what it is. I mean, like like I said, God's got a plan for me, and uh, and if my my you know if this is His plan, then that's it. You know, and and I'm not going to stop until I make as much impact as possible. I'm going to try to help as many kids and people and and people that are being victimized and trafficking not just children, but, uh, you know, I, I have a, a skill set that I could use for good. And, and like I said, I've been doing for a few years now, um, just completely under the radar, you know, not breaking any laws or anything, but assisting other organizations to help find these guys, because I had no luck, you know, in my own, my own uh, endeavors in the beginning. Um, but, you know, it, it ended up working out. I started a little organization locally a couple months ago, maybe six, almost six months ago now. Uh, and, you know, we caught a ton of a ton of people that were thinking they were meeting a child in real life and police would arrest them. And uh, that was called five, six, well, still is called five, six, one PC. Yeah, this is interesting. So this is something I saw when we first got acquainted. I was looking you up on Instagram and followed this and people, some people have seen this on YouTube, right? So you, you and your MMA buddy who looks like kind of a, just a dude you wouldn't want to get punched in the face by 
generally speaking. He's undefeated. <laughs> M- he's undefeated. He's a. Uh, he's got. I think he's got seven knockouts, eight wins. He actually doesn't look that scary, but you just know that he is because he's an undefeated. Oh, he's an yeah. animal. Yeah, absolute animal. But he he looks like just kind of a normal athletic dude in the, in the photos, but I go to church with him twice a week. Yeah. He's a great dude. It, it, uh, he must be. And, but at the end of the day, if you are at a Walmart to meet who you think is an 11 year old girl and you and that guy come up and say, are you looking for Ashley? You know, you done screwed up at that point. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And the way that we did it was, uh, you know, it, it, every single time I'd be holding the camera and he would, he would be reading the chat logs that would be collected by an adult. An adult would decoy as a child. We never used real children, but obviously um, they would decoy as a child and then um, get that person to meet up, which the person would ask, you know, the child would act, the decoy would act like a child and, and nothing more, not talk sexual, not reach out to a guy first. These guys reach out on their own. Um, and it is scarily fast, how, how, you know, how, how quick, this all goes down. Sometimes, you know, sometimes the, the guys that are really bad will be a little more careful and they'll want like pictures with, uh, they'll say like, put, uh, you know, put three fingers up in front of a, a TV to prove that you are, you know, you're real. Um, those guys are the ones that seem like they're probably, they've probably done this before or they do this often. Um, we, we've caught a few of those and, you know, a lot of them got arrested on the scene. You could find that on YouTube. But uh, yeah, so it's, it, you know, we would we would meet them, and instead of it being a child, it would be us with a camera, and we'd start reading the chat logs off to them, and they'd either you know walk away or they'd admit it. But uh, we've only had two people walk away from us, and the reason for that is because I do my it's called open source intelligence, or for short OSINT. Uh, you know, I, I know who they are. It doesn't matter if they're using a username or just whatever. You know, you send me a picture of your face, which goes back to what my company does. I have your phone number, whether it be fake or real, or, you know, there's, there's many ways for me to figure out who you are with just, even just a logo of where you work on your t-shirt, sure. uh, you know, you'd, you'd be surprised at some of the stuff that can be put together with the tiniest detail. Well, you caught, but, um, caught that one dude who basically just gumpily strolls out of Walmart and gets into his Prius and almost runs you guys over. And you're like, Brent, we know where you work. We know you work at whatever. And he's like, uh, I don't know what you're talking about. It's like, so he just has this panic reaction. And you just realize this guy must. And I saw, I said to myself when I saw that video, this was the last time this guy's going to do that. And then you're like, actually, they caught Brent 1,200 miles away in another Ten days state. later. Ten days later, yeah. So he left. He left. And uh, I got the chat logs from another organization. And, uh, and Brent, since he never, he didn't say a word to us when he printed out of the Walmart, he thought he was being chased by police, even though we make it very clear. Um, Dustin and I, we, we say, you know, we're, we're not police officers. You're free to go. You're not being held against your will. We, we make it very clear that we're not, you know, holding them because it's, yeah, we don't want to get, we don't want to, we, we don't want to get in trouble for trying to do the right thing. For sure. Um, but yeah, Brent, I knew he was a teacher beforehand. I knew that uh, he, he had a bachelor's degree in some type of teaching. I knew he worked at two different schools. Um, I knew all of this going into it. I knew that, you know, who his family was. I knew where he currently worked. I knew all of his social medias. I knew everything about him. So when he was walking away, I was trying to say some of the details that would, that most guys would say, oh, crap, he knows a lot about me. Let's, let me stop and talk. Maybe I can talk my way out of this, um, which in reality, no matter what they say, the police are on their way. Um, so Brent just takes off full speed and uh, I chase him to his car and since we never got a word in about whether we were police or not, he just assumed that we were. And, uh, you know, Scrappy and I get a text message and we find out that the guy was caught again, 1200 miles away by another predator catcher. Um, and in, in the chat logs, he said, I was chased out of Walmart by two police officers. Wow. So it was just like, the guy didn't even know, but just imagine about you know, him driving. He probably ran out of Florida thinking he was wanted if I had to guess. Mm-hmm. Um, and then he, imagine the times, like I said earlier, imagine the times he was not caught. He, if he's caught twice in 10 days, 1200 miles apart. Um, what, and what about the times he wasn't caught? You know, it's, yeah. uh, and he's, the guy is still walking the street right now. He's not arrested. This oh, guy's still, you know, he may be, he may listen to this. Yeah. I'd like to think the demographics of this show don't include a lot of pedophiles, but statistically speaking, there's got to be at least one, right? I mean, this is a, it's got to be at least one. Somebody's going to listen to this and they're going to be in this, you know, do you want me to name the website? Yeah. Why not? Yeah. So the website was rapey.to.so.co and .su. There was four different versions of the same domain name. Wow. 
Um, but they all were the, exactly the same thing. So if, if you are a member of, of uh, one of those sites, um, you know, I mean, I, I guess you have every reason in the world to be scared. Yeah. Wow. And also, really gross name, rapey.to, like right on the nose, not trying to hide it at all. I mean, I know that sounds kind of funny, but I don't even mean it to be. It's just really gross. They're not even trying to sugarcoat it. It's just like open rape of kids. Of course. And, and the stuff that I'm reading to you, anyone could see. Remember, so all this stuff was publicly accessible for anyone to read. Um, did you get to the point in the, the video that you watched where you saw who was hosting this website? Yeah, I saw that it was hosted by somebody who hosted the Pirate Bay, which for people who don't know is basically like a BitTorrent kind of software movies website. Everybody who's 40 or so and went to college with fast internet and has done BitTorrent even once in their life was probably on the Pirate Bay get grabbing music and movies. Not gross stuff or illegal stuff, literally like Pirates of the Caribbean DVD rips. Yeah, exactly. So the Pirate Bay was just a completely different thing. And he was one of the three creators, founders of the Pirate Bay. And uh, I, I have some communications between him and the administrator of the site where he, you know, says that he manually reviewed the site, which if you're hosting a website, you have more access to it than what the public does. So my point in saying that the stuff I'm reading you was publicly accessible for anyone to read, he had access to read the private messages. He could look on the server. He could have grabbed any images. And he said that he reviewed the site and all he saw was troll comments and holiday photos of children. And he, he said that he didn't see anything offensive there. So obviously, I can, I'm not going to say that if Frederick is a pedophile, because I don't know if he <laughs> is or not, but I know that he was okay with hosting a website that was creating, soliciting, and showing child pornography. And uh, he, was, you know, yeah. he was accepting money to not only host it, but set it up. Like he actually configured the server based on the logs I have. And the thing is, web hosting is not that expensive, I would imagine. So it's not like he was getting paid millions of dollars to host this and he just looked to the other way. That's what makes me think he's a pedophile. Or yeah, well, he may be. He lives in Thailand. So that's also a red flag in my eyes. But, you know, no, there's no way. To well, to be fair, actually a lot it. of people live in Thailand. <laughs> yeah, in I, fact, I, well, a lot of criminals move to Thailand, though. That's what yeah, I know. I, know. I, I know what you mean. Um, but yeah. I'm going to I'm going to go ahead. Seventy one point six million people, uh, give or take, also live in Thailand. Oh, I didn't mean it in a racist way. You know what I mean? <laughs> I, I'm just kidding. I, I'm giving you shit because it's like, well. He lives in Thailand. It's like, all right. All no, right not pal. everyone in Thailand is bad. I'll make that very clear. <laughs> Lovely place. Lovely yeah, place. I, I have no problem with people in Thailand. Uh, no. I do have a problem if you're hosting a pedophile right? yes, and you live in I, Thailand. I, would, I think, we can, I think, every, I think all 71.6 million Thais can also agree that running a child porn website uh, from Thailand is not no, okay. don't hate me. I didn't. I didn't mean it. No, no. I'm just giving you. I'm giving you. Crap. I'm trying to keep it a little bit lighter because this is such a heavy show, right? I'm trying to. I'm trying. I'm yeah, grasping at the humor straws where I can get them. Um, yeah, I, I appreciate that because yeah. I've been talking about it for a couple of weeks straight now, yeah. and it's a you know, it's, it, it's not. It, it's it's getting to me. It genuinely is getting to me. You showed me a demo of going into a chat room and seeing the predators basically pop up. I, what, what is it? You Google like teen chat room, Florida, and, it, and you click on the first freaking link, go in there, and you're starting to get DMs or, or private messages right away. And I've told this story on the show before, so I'll keep it super, super short. But uh, and I think I told you as well offline that when I was young, I was working at a security company. And the guys were asking me how I meet women because they were talking about real dating. And I said online on AOL and they're like, what, how does that work? And we just got to talking that I was DMing women on or instant messaging women on America online. And the, one of the guys is brilliant. He said, hey, if you want to learn how to stand out from the other guys, because I was like, they're like, what do you say? I'm like, uh, hi. And they're like, oh, it's lame, right? You know, you need to pick up lines. They said, if you want to stand out from the other guys, make a profile as a girl and see what comes your way. And that was how I discovered exactly what you demonstrated in that chat exactly. room. Because I thought... Yeah, so for, the, for those yeah. who haven't seen uh, what I demonstrated in the chat room, it was within 10 seconds, a uh, 47-year-old man was, was interested in talking sexually with a 13-year-old girl. Um, and, uh, you know, that's re reproducible at any moment, at any time, because I've shown so many people, just to show an example of it. And a lot of people might think, well... There are some weird chat rooms on the internet. There, that's where the predators are hanging out. Well, this is not just the teen chats. This is Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, Snapchat, Xbox, Roblox, Minecraft, 
I could go on for hours with all the different platforms. These guys are in, you know, especially if you're a little girl, but little boys too, it doesn't, it doesn't matter oh, yeah. um, what, what your gender is, um, any gender for that matter. And, uh, you know, it's, it's very prevalent anywhere. And, you know, I, if you, if you have the stomach to deal with it, try it for yourself, you know, set up an account. There's nothing illegal about making an account saying you're a child and just, just wait for somebody to message you. you. You'll be blown away at how quick it happens. So it's important for your kids to know that, you know, it's okay to come to you about this stuff. That you're not going to get mad at them because you're going to protect them at the end of the day. And then secondly, um, I I'm also I'm, want to make it very clear that I don't believe personally that you'd be a helicopter parent is the term for it. If you are going through your kids' devices or asking who their friends are and not just taking their word for it, you know, figure out who their friends are. And like when I was a kid, it, my mom was very, very lenient and not very strict whatsoever. But if I was staying at someone's house or if I was hanging out with somebody, like when I was very young, uh, she would call the parents and yeah. make sure that I was where I said that I was. And, you know, there was no such thing as an iPad um, babysitter back when I was a kid. So, you know, <laughs> Don't judge my me. mom. My... <laughs> <laughs> I feel attacked. Well, that, that's, you know, that's what most people are doing nowadays. Is, you know, they just hand the iPad over and it, it, the problem is the iPad's connected to the internet most of the time. And, you know, kids are a lot more advanced than they were when I was a kid. And when you were a kid, I'm sure. Darn right. So, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's just important to make sure you know what your kids are doing and not just taking their word for it. Because remember when you were a kid, I mean, how often were you honest with your parents? Sure. And now they can hide a chat app in a fake calculator or something fake calculator yeah, app on their phone. I've seen this. It works. Yeah. It functions. The app will actually, the calculator app will actually function um, unless you put the right pin in right. and then you put the pin in, you hit the right button and then the other app opens. It's amazing. It really is amazing. I, and I know, I know about this because one of my buddies is kind of like a, he just, he's an older guy. He got divorced and he's like, look at these young lassies that I'm dating. And I'm like, okay. And he busts out a calculator app and I'm like, what are you going to, Oh, got it. I don't need to know all these details, man. <laughs> like it was, it was like, they, it, it, they weren't young girls that he was dating. I mean, he was just dating regular women, but he kept like the photos hidden in an app, which actually I guess maybe is for when the girl that he's dating that day looks in his phone when he's in the bathroom no, and course. finds all the 83 other girls he's talking to online or women, yeah, I should say, hidden. he's like 50. <laughs> it's his hidden stash. Yeah, it's his stash. And yeah. if if a 50-year-old man, or he's probably pushing 60, can do that, then a teenage kid who is born natively into with a friggin' iPhone in their hand is going to figure out how to chat with somebody in a gaming app that you don't even know exists. Exactly. And, and uh, you know, it's, it's for parents that don't understand, you can start a game and immediately as you start a game, you are, you're matched up with complete strangers. And these strangers could be nine-year-old kids. They could be 50-year-old men or women or whatever gender. They could be anybody. So there, there is no, there's no matchmaking. You know, I'm sure there is in some games. But most, most of the time, there's no matchmaking that's matching kids up with kids. And uh, a lot of times, kids, they want to see the adult stuff. They want to see the mature games. So they're going to lie about their ages, sure. you know? Yeah, it's a uh, it, maybe they might have a squeaky voice or whatever, but they might lie about their age and their profile mm -hmm. and uh, and get into certain things that maybe a matchmaking matchmaking software that otherwise would have put them with other kids, puts them with adults. So it's you know, not every game is that way. I'm just guessing there. But, you know, I, it's just be careful is all I'm saying. Just For make sure. sure you know what your kid's doing. Now, Megan Phelps Roper, who escaped the Westboro Baptist Church cult. Do you know about this cult? You heard about oh, this? I know all about it. Yeah. yeah. So she was on the show, episode 302. One of the ways she got out, and I'm going off memory here, is I think she was playing words with friends, and it matched her with a guy who was just really nice and chatty and talked to her and like added her on the app. And they used to play all the time. And he slowly started asking her questions. And then that those questions, he, I think he was like a rabbi or something. Those questions made her think. And then she was like, wait a minute, this is insane. I'm in a cult. And she escaped. And so, and obviously, yeah, well, thank God she got out. Thank God. Right? But she's horrible people, in my opinion. She's in a cult. She's in a high control situation. Imagine your normal parent with your kid. You're not controlling everything they do. You don't know about words with friends or whatever the equivalent is. She was in a high control situation where they were looking at her texts and phone calls. They just didn't see the chats inside words with friends. 
Right. And, and she that's knew why that. it's super important for not, like I said, not only to go through your kids' devices to make sure you know what they're doing, but let them know that it's okay to be honest with you um, about that stuff specifically. Because this stuff, you know, for these predators, it's, you know, it's a couple minutes, if, you know, um, if, if that of their time, but it's going to cause trauma for that child for the rest of their life because of, uh, you know, it, it's not your fault if it happens, you know, it's, it's the pedophile's fault or, or the predator's fault. But, you know, if, if you can prevent that, just prevent it. What was interesting is during that demo that you did with the chat rooms, mm -hmm. whenever I have done a similar demo years ago, it's been years, but whenever I did a similar demo years ago, because I had to show my parents, I showed the FBI these chat logs, we ended up entrapping somebody. So that's what we have in common is uh, we entrapped this guy. I shouldn't say entrapped because it was his own thing. It wasn't. Yeah, well, you're not law enforcement, right. so you, you can entrap. Right. So so this guy was it, clearly old. I remember I came into work and I said, uh, let me let me back up because this wasn't the demo. This is when I started getting the the instant messages as a girl on AOL, and I was like, "Ah, oh, look at these!" I printed off transcripts, or I should say, I went to work and the, I told the guys what losers were DMing me. I was thirty eight and I'm talking to a fourteen year old. My boss was like, "Whoa, th I know you think this is a laugh. These guys are actually it's it, it. This is not funny. These guys are predators. Print the transcript of the chat if you can." And I was like, "Yeah, I can. It's all saved. It's AOL. It's just like a thing that I I can print right from when I'm doing it." And so I started saving them in text files and printing them off. And the we had to fax them to the FBI. The Detroit office was like, "We don't handle cyber crime here." Can you imagine? That's a that's a bygone era. We don't handle computer oh, yeah. stuff at the Very Detroit gone. office. So they faxed it to D or they sent it to DC. And I remember that Agent Forrester at the FBI was like, "Hey man, this is bad." How many of these do you have? And I'm like, every time I log in, there's email messages waiting, and I go into a chat room and I get 20 of these. Yep. Uh, trust me, I, I know, and I haven't been a decoy myself other than a few times just to show examples of it. And our first guy we ever caught, uh, Scrappy and I, was we, we decoyed for that one because we 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 just wanted to make it happen that night. But uh, yeah, I, I totally understand. And reading the chat logs, even not interacting with them. Is hard enough. It's so, creepy. Uh, it's super creepy. Yeah. So it's, we we got this guy to go drive across state lines, Michigan and Ohio, or, or at least where I was, southeastern Michigan. You it's could a get felony to, in itself. Yeah, you could get to delete it. Well, that was the idea because the local cops were like, "Oh, it's not us. It's AOL. They're in Virginia." And the FBI finally was like, "Okay, the locals are not going to know what the hell's going on with this." So we basically just had came up with the idea to get them to cross state lines, and then the FBI could say, "Oh, now you're crossing state lines to pay a minor." for a sexual yeah, encounter is a traveling uh you know it's a traveling charge for fe a felony yeah because because it has more teeth and so that was pretty rewarding but the idea that when it what was what always kept me up at night and still does to this day was i saw so much incoming and there's no way we even got one in a thousand of them and that was no, in the 90s no. and that's i mean that's that's definitely the truth it's it's I don't believe it's stoppable, but I believe that, you know, whatever impact you can make uh, is good enough. I mean, it, it this, if you just let it go rampant and, and, you know, hope for the best, it's just going to continue to get worse. And I don't, I don't, I don't know. I, I, I don't have the answer to pedophilia. I don't have the answer to uh, pedophiles or human trafficking, but I, I do know that I can offer some of my abilities and some of my, uh, my network to do something about it uh, on a large scale. That doesn't mean it's going to end it, but if, even if I make a small dent, or like I say, you know, if I can help one kid, it's worth it. I mean, recently in the past few weeks, since, since you know my stuff has been going pretty, I guess, viral for other words, I've had two mothers come up to me from like just two different areas too that can, you know would have never known me otherwise that hugged me and thanked me and like you know, it, like I'm not doing this for recognition by any means, but it felt good to know that I made a difference. And uh, maybe their kids won't have this problem, you know, because because of something that I said or, or did. So that's, that stuff makes me feel good. And and uh, and I guess on the other, the flip side of that is, do I recommend any anybody else do you know vigilante justice? Go out there and catch them on your own? No, I don't. I think that it's dangerous. Yeah. And I think you're putting people, you know, well they're putting themselves in a, a situation, but um. They're the most vulnerable people in the world because they know they did the worst crime possible. And, uh, you know, they 
unfortunately they hurt people they kill cops they do they do really bad things so uh do i recommend that you go out and do it absolutely yeah, not the, the, um, backing somebody like that into a corner could be dangerous right if they're desperate and they think the jig is up i mean there's i would imagine if you're one of those guys you have a nightmare scenario and maybe you have a plan for that scenario which is kill the per person who's after you and then possibly just kill yourself later and you just yeah, don't want to be there. Yeah, that happens a lot. You know, it ha it happens a lot. I mean, you can look up cases about it all the time where they're serving they're serving warrants on this type of stuff and they'll they'll blow their heads off or they'll kill they'll kill the people serving the warrant. You know, it's it's it happens all the time. Yeah, that doesn't surprise me. I mean, these Yeah, so I'm not saying that I'm some fearless guy cuz I'm just I'm a skidding computer geek, <laughs> but uh, you know, and and Dustin isn't going to out punch a bullet. Yeah, but you um, turn sideways, but, they can't hit you. You're that thin. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I could just float through the air. Exactly. But it's it's uh, you know, it, it's if for something, you know, I if for some reason something did happen to me, um, you know, it's uh, at least at least uh, you guys know I was I was trying my best. <laughs> You know, it's, uh, that's the best I can say. You know, I, I really don't have a, a better answer for anybody on that one. Because a lot of people are messaging me saying, be safe. You need 24-7 security. You need this. They're going to suicide them. They, got, they have all these things that people keep saying to me. And it's like, if that happens, you know, like, like I said, God had a plan for me. And I don't know why this was his plan for me. It, 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 you know, I have a passion for helping victimized children and victimized people. And, uh, and I guess that even goes back to drug addicts. But um. You know, I, this is, this is my goal right now to not only run my companies, which is a separate thing, but in, in the time that I do have available, uh, focusing it all on this. So knowing that you're, you've done something similar that to what I was doing when I was 17, 18 years old with the, the chat room stuff uh, or the, uh, not the chat room stuff, but the, the, the confrontations, oh, yeah, the chat room stuff. So let me, let me bounce this off you. Cause there's nobody I've ever been able to bounce this off of. So people used to ask me why do predators in the chat rooms, some of them will say they're a 17 year old boy and they're talking to a 17 year old girl, but others will say, well, they'll just tell you that they're 53, even though they think you're 14. And my theory, and this is just a theory, I have no real basis for this other than experience, is that the ones who lie about their age, they either aren't gonna do anything in real life, they're just perverts, they're looking for a LARP kind of experience, or they're inexperienced and they have some sort of like vague, terrible plan to deal with their real age gap at some point later when they meet up. But the guys who admit that they're 50 and they're talking to a 14 year old, those guys are scarier because they're admitting their age for a reason. And I think the reason is because from the jump, they're planning on a real life encounter and they don't want to break trust and because right. otherwise why risk scaring away a kid in the chat room if you're just going to stay in the chat room they know they have to disclose because they're grooming the target so that always well, i have me a up story for you there i mean and, and i agree with you to some degree but i've seen the opposite you know there, one of one of the first people i caught in south florida for example um he was using a picture of a guy that was in a band and he was portraying himself to be 19 um he was using a fake name and he wanted to meet what he believed was an 11 year old girl uh, at a hotel in Deerfield Beach. Uh, or I'm sorry, no, it wasn't Deerfield. It was Pompano Beach, Florida, which is, you know, it's not one of the best areas around here. But either way, he wanted this little girl to meet him at the hotel. I already found out who the guy was um, by, you know, OSINT. And uh, I knew that he was a 40, you know, mid in his mid 40s, he was working in a, where he worked. I, I knew everything about the guy going up there. And I found out that he had a room book specifically for that girl to stay the night. He ordered food. He, uh, he had, you know, he admitted to everything on camera, wow. admitted to all of his intentions. Um, and, uh, you know, nothing, nothing happened from it, but the guy that just think of it like this, if it wasn't us that showed up, an 11 year old girl would have seen a man in his mid forties, not some 19 year old boy that, that wasn't even the picture that he was using. Right. Um, he, he had like a slight resemblance of the guy, but like not even close, mm -hmm. like very, very slight resemblance. Maybe, maybe the same haircut, maybe. So his plan was to just hope for the best at that point. I don't, I don't know what is he, his plan could have well have been grabbing the girl as soon as he saw her and bringing her to the room. We don't know, but instead it was, uh, it was it actually wasn't just Scrappy and I, it was one other guy we brought because he happened to be with us. And, uh, he was, I don't believe he was in the video. He might've been. We never published that one yet. We still have it, but um, the uh, yeah, yeah. It's it, I don't know what his plan was going to be with that with that eleven year old girl. 
that's scary. I, I just always assume the guys who disclosed, they were like, eh, if I tell them up front, then it's one less p way for my plan to fail because they're already comfortable meeting an old man. Uh, or yeah, I say I mean, old it, man, I'm saying it goes both ways. I'm 43. It goes both ways because some of them, some of them don't want to meet. They just want you to send them pictures or talk sexually, uh -huh. um, you know, or whatever, whatever they want, you know, and they don't ever want to meet up. Like they could talk about their real age because for some reason it's not illegal to do that. Um, not illegal yeah, to fantasize about extremely kids. Extremely gross, yeah. But it is illegal to act on it. So I, it's just a really weird, weird uh, set of of rules there, and I'm learning more about it as I go. Indeed, God, I'm, man. Look, look, I'm no professional when it comes to how the government handle this stuff. Handles this stuff. I don't know the psychology of a pedophile or predator. Um, and I've been doing it now for three years, and I still don't understand it. Um, but I, I'm I'm picking up pieces, you know, while especially doing these investigations. Well, we've gone quite a ways here. There's going to be a two-part episode for sure. And I, I will say, it made me feel a little gross. I'm sure you're used to that. But I am so glad that you are doing what you are doing. And next time I find myself in Florida, I'll come hang and I'll take you to dinner. But I am not going to eat Campbell's chicken noodle soup. You're going to have to expand your palate, man. For God's sake. Uh -huh. Yeah, may, maybe, but I feel like I'll bring some Campbell's with me to the restaurant. Yeah. If you bring a can of Campbell's to a Morton Steakhouse, we... We might get kicked out, but it'll be a good story. Well, we're going to find out. <laughs> we will. Uh, look, I, I'm going to steal a comedy bit that I think is relevant and lighten the show up right here at the end. I did not ask Gianmaro Soresi for permission, so don't sue me, Gianmaro. Uh, don't, uh, sorry, Gianmarco. Don't sue me, Gianmarco. Uh, this is it, it, it required to, to lighten things up, but it's very relevant. You'll hear. I have a girlfriend right now. <laughs> Um, thank you, thank you. Neither of us has very good taste in music, so uh, whenever we're about to make love, I put on a random Spotify playlist. And uh, uh, a couple months ago, I put on an R&B playlist. I, I, I was feeling ambitious. And, <laughs> and R. Kelly came on. Yes, you've heard the news? <laughs> And, and my, my, my girlfriend was like, oh, no, we cannot listen to R. Kelly. R. Kelly is a pedophile. And now here's the thing. And just, just hear me out for one second. <laughs> technically speaking, technically speaking, R. Kelly is not a pedophile. Just give me one second. I promise this goes away. <laughs> um, just hear me out. The, 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 the term pedophile refers to people who are attracted to those that are prepubescent. Then there's something called a hebophile. That's people who are attracted to those in the early stages of puberty, like 11, 12, 13, 14. And then there's something called an ephebophile. That's people who are attracted to those in the later stages of puberty, like 15, 16, 17, 18. But I think the reason we don't make those distinctions is because it's very hard to explain the difference <laughs> without sounding like a pedophile. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is exactly right. Yeah, That's a great one. It's a great bit. And I, I hope I don't get friggin' canceled for stealing this, but I think I thought it was so good. And I'll link to that in the show notes. Jo I love that. John Marco I, I've never heard that before. Yeah. That is that is so true, though. Yeah, I mean, so imagine true. somebody tries to, you're, imagine like, dude, you like, you know, girl, you're kind of a pedophile. No, actually, I'm an e-he before. You're like, okay, no, never <laughs> yeah. hanging out with this guy again. Ryan, thank you so much, man. I'm proud to know you. You're taking a real risk to expose this in the way that you have, and uh, I think it's admirable. Thank you so much, and I appreciate you having me on the show, man. Thanks for checking out this entire episode of The Jordan Harbinger Show. If you're interested in exploring this topic further, check out The Jordan Harbinger Show podcast feed. There, we dive even deeper on this and many other topics. In the audio podcast, I also close open loops, cover things discussed off camera, off air, and give some parting lessons from our guest. You can find The Jordan Harbinger Show in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, any podcast app, or at jordanharbinger.com. And also, if you found this episode useful, please share it with those you care about. Last but not least, like, comment, and subscribe.